My name is Kathy Kling, and I'm chair of the Water Science and Technology Board. Um, welcome everybody this morning to what's going to be a really uh, exciting joint effort of the Water Science and Technology Board and whatever BASC stands for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Our close sister board. <laughs> no, um, so first we're going to do some business. Um, yeah. <laughs> the first piece of business is for me to learn what BAS stands for. Uh, and no, I'm, uh, and uh, first is, is to do some introductions. So uh, what we want to do is uh, everybody in the room, we're just going to go around. Please say your name, your affiliation in terms of which board you're with, and maybe your home, your your day job. And we'll, we'll go around quickly. We do have about uh, a great number of people online. So um, when, you, when you speak, you do need to put your, your speaker on. We will not do names for people that are online. It just gets, it gets too time consuming. But um, please do put your, your speaker on. So uh, uh, let's start on this end. Go Stephanie ahead. Johnson, staff with the Water Science and Technology Board. Ever Joseph, University of Albany, Basque. Rob Dunbar, Stanford University, Basque. Uh, Bill Gale, Global Weather Corporation, Basque. Uh, Dave Titley, uh, Penn State, Basque. Kay Whitlock, a consulting engineer from Chicago, uh, Water Science and Technology Board. I'm Mark LeChevalier, I'm also on the Water Science and Technology Board, a uh, retired consultant. Mary Glacken, Basque, uh, the weather company, IBM. Uh, Dave Wagner, Water Science Technology Board, retired scientist. Jonathan Overpeck, University of Michigan, Board of Atmospheric Sciences and Climate. <laughs> John Arthur, State Geologist, Florida, Director of Florida Geological Survey, WISTB. <laughs> Nick Keener, Duke Energy Corporation, Basque. Terry Hogue, Colorado School of Mines, Basque. Elizabeth Ada, Director of the Water Science and Technology Board. Ravi Shankar, Basque. I'm from Colorado State University. Shui Chen, University of Miami, uh, University of Washington. <laughs> <laughs> I, I recently moved. <laughs> Basque. Uh, Amanda Stout, Director of the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate. Amanda Purcell, Staff of Bath. David Sedlak, UC Berkeley, Water Science and Technology Board. I'm Jonathan Mott, and I'm uh, at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and I'm on the BASC. Uh, Margaret Palmer, University of Maryland and National Socio Environmental Synthesis Center, and I'm on the Water Science Board. Pam M. Schnorther, Grumman, BASC. Peter Frumhoff, Union of Concerned Scientists, BASC. Uh, David Halpern, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Uh, I'm the liaison to Basque from the Ocean Studies Board. Dave Dezombeck, Carnegie Mellon University with the Water Science and Technology Board. Allison Steiner, University of Michigan, Basque. Wendy Graham, University of Florida, Water Science and Technology Board. Ruby Long, Pacific Northwest National Lab, Basque. Dwayne Walliser, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory, Basque. I'm Lauren Everett with Basque staff. Sorry, you caught me off guard here. I didn't know I'd use a microphone. Mr. Corey Hummel from Headquarters U.S. Air Force. Joe Bird, the USD Forest Service, Office of Science of Sustainability and Climate. April Melvin with Basque staff. Modut Khan, NASA Earth Science Division. Katie Thomas, Bath Staff. Jesse Carmen, NOAA's Office of Weather and Air Quality. Bonnie Brown, NOAA OAR, Office of Weather and Air Quality. John Infanti, NOAA's Office of Weather and Air Quality. Uh, Mike McCracken, Climate Institute. Grant Davis with Sonoma Water. Rutgers University. Andy Robertson from the International Research Institute for Climate and Society, Columbia University.
David Raff, Bureau of Reclamation. Janine Jones, California Department of Water Resources and Western States Water Council. Andy Miller, AMS. Jessica Mormon, Department of Energy, Climate and Environmental Sciences Division. Erica Brown, Association of Metropolitan Water Agencies. Bob Hirsch, hydrologist, recently retired from USGS. Laura Samansky, Geological Society of America. Uh, and Rita Mariotti, uh, NOAA Research Climate Program Office on the details to the National Weather Service. Raha Kim Navar, USDA Forest Service. Uh, Laura Ehlers, staff with the Water Science and Technology Board. Dave DeWitt, Director of NOAA National Weather Service Climate Prediction Center. Ari Gerstmann, University Corporation for Atmospheric Research. Vanta Grubisic, <coughs> National Center for Atmospheric Research. Emily Remmel, National Association of Clean Water Agencies. I am Laurie Geller. I'm with the staff of BASC. Is that it? I am Peter Colahan from the Office of Water Prediction at NOAA. One more. Carly Brody, Water Science and Technology Board. Okay, excellent. That was actually a test. I would say an A, A minus. Almost everybody used their mic correctly, and everybody knew where they worked. So we we're, we're got a good we got a good start on the day. Well, very good. Uh, okay. Couple more logistic things. Um, this is going to be recorded, just so everyone is aware that this uh, is being done. Um, afterwards, uh, we've asked speakers to talk this morning for 25 minutes. Um, we're going to stay pretty close to that, so that we have 15 to 20 minutes of uh, time to ask questions. In terms of doing questions, if you're in the room and at the table, please put your sign up, and I'll keep a list of, of the order. Um, if you're online, there is a way through Zoom that you can um, post questions. Um, we have Amanda will be watching and um, collecting those questions. And to the t depending on how time goes, we will get to as many of those as we can. Um, so, uh, and also, when you do ask a question, we're going to um, ask that you just say your name and where you f you're from again, because for people online to know to, to put a, a name and a face together. Okay, um, I'm going to now turn it to Elizabeth for a couple more questions, and then we'll be able to really kick this off. Good morning, everyone. I just have a couple of housekeeping announcements and, and very importantly, our safety uh, announcement as well. Um, because you all are our guests here today, we want to make sure that you have an enjoyable day, a safe day, a fun day, and a comfortable day. Um, if we do hear an alarm sound, um, what we need you all to do is uh, take your very small items, not the suitcases, very small items uh, with you and exit through the uh, designated doors. Many of you came in to the doors off here to my left. That's one good way to exit the building uh, going out um, the way you came through the Great Hall and then out through the doors, the main doors of the building onto the Constitution Avenue side. Those of you who are sitting on this side, you'll also see a door where underneath the clock you can also get out to the, the front lobby that way. Um, you'll exit through there and down a short flight of stairs. All of you would very much appreciate trying to squeeze many people through a very small opening versus many people through two large openings into a larger space. So try to uh, gauge the door space and, and where people are headed and just exit in a calm fashion. Our um, uh, assembly point is actually on Constitution Avenue, which is over to the, the window side here. So we just exit and move away from the building down to the sidewalk and wait until we were told to re-enter the building. As far as other uh, parts of the day, we will have um, refreshments out, out um, in the, uh, the uh, area um, next to the room here. Uh, lunch as well will be provided. Everyone is welcome to join us for lunch. Uh, the restrooms are also located directly across from this, uh, the, this little atrium uh, here, if you, if you need to uh, use those, we have breaks, but please feel free to, to pop up and, and um, get something to drink or, or refresh yourself if you need to do that. Um, as 
as uh, Kathy said, this, this will be recorded. Um, we would like to try to post the recording if we can, uh, subsequent to the meeting, and we would let you all know uh, when, when that, uh, that recording was posted. So with that, I'll turn things back over to Kathy and Robbie. Thank you, uh, Elizabeth. Um, and thank you all for coming. We, we have a really exciting day. I'm just gonna make a, a, a couple of really, again, welcoming remarks. This is a joint activity of the Board on Atmospheric Sciences and Climate and the Water Science and Technology Board. Um, we um, feel that this is the kind of activity we should probably be doing more of, joining our board's intellect and efforts, um, learning from each other. One of the ways that, um, that I've started to learn to think about things is, is new terminology to me, and that is, the real, is horizontal water and vertical water. Uh, and our board is sort of the, the horizontal water, uh, the vertical water is uh, it, that stuff that goes up and down in the air, which I don't really understand. So, uh, no, uh, seriously, I think that this is an extremely important and valuable contribution. And today we have an amazing uh, group of people to really give us some insight into the frontiers of some very important work in terms of prediction and modeling to help us understand where uh, seasonal, subseasonal uh, predictions are going, what kinds of research is happening, and how that can really be used um, for impact on the ground in the various agencies. So welcome uh, to you. I'm going to um, turn it to, to Ravi now for a few more comments and then I'll be um, moderating this morning um, and I am going to be kind of tough on people so please do try to keep us on time. Um, I will um, wave and look angsty if um, it starts getting getting long because I do want to respect everybody's uh, everybody's time in here. So with that, Ravi, please. Thank you, Kathy. Um, I think Kathy covered some of the key points. Uh, I just want to add a, like about five quick points from my perspective and that of BASC. Um, I haven't checked with BASC members, but hopefully they'll agree with what I'm going to say. If, if you don't, please tell me after in the break rather than right now. Okay, um, you know, what really matters to the country and the citizens is how life can be better for them and what various organizations do for them. Uh, but science and technology needs um, in-depth understanding and expertise. That essentially means that we are kind of siloed in how we do things in many ways. But the real world issues require cross-disciplinary work to make things work. This is why NAS and NRC need to go beyond our expertise areas and this is a one such step in kind of bringing together expertise in related issues um, in, in dealing with some important things, specifically water. So I think NAS is working together and it's doing a good job for the most part, but really is in the initial stages. We don't have as many of these kinds of meetings as we should. We had a couple of others before, I'm, sh I'm sure way before my time, but um, it's a good start. And water in, in particular is a very important issue. Um, it's the cent at the center of life, as you know, and most of you probably don't appreciate water as much as you probably would if you're from a country where I was born, like India. Uh, water is life. Uh, if you think about the global uh, Kind of sustainability development goals, water is at the center of many of them. In many nations and many other parts of the international issues are about water. The big problem about water is, even though we have a big ocean, as you all know, is having water when you need it and um, where you want it. Not too much, not too little, either of which can cause you problems. So this is kind of what makes water and such an important issue, especially fresh water. Um, and this is a very good opportunity for us to come together to discuss issues related to water, which is affected by climate, meteorology, weather, uh, along with other things that happen. We're talking the vertical water as well as the horizontal water. So with that, um, Shui, do you want to add anything? Thank you. You said no? 
Okay, thank you. In that case, Kathy, over to you. All right. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Well, with that, we'll go right to our panelists. Um, the bios for all the panelists are in the program, so we're not going to uh, take time to, to do a bio introduction. Um, I'd just like to turn it right now um, to our first speaker, Andrew Robertson, and if you could just maybe a one sentence to kick things off of, of who you are and where you're from, just to remind people, and then um, we're really looking forward to your presentation. Okay, so uh, yes, I'm Andy Robertson from the IRI. I'm the head of the climate group there. And I'm a co-chair on the International World Weather, World Climate Research Program, S2S, S2S project. Uh, so that's probably why I'm here uh, to win to you. So thanks so much for the opportunity for, uh, to, to present here. It's a great honor for me. And I think it, it's just wonderful to see this uh, joint session uh, of the two boards on, on, on atmospheric sciences and on, on, on water. Uh, and, on, and focusing on this topic of uh, S2S. And it's, it's exactly the kind of thing that we're thinking of in, in, in this international S2S project. Uh, so uh, lo I think there's so many opportunities and I'm thrilled and thanks for so many people from the outside for coming, coming and being part of this and, and online too. So I thought I'd just flash this one up, uh, this, this slide up. Uh, I'm sure you're all familiar with this. Uh, let me. Oh, yes, uh, the, the, the report uh, that the National Academies uh, uh, came out with a, a couple of years ago uh, on, this, on this topic and uh, I thought it was, it was great to see this vision that was, that was put forward there by, by this, this, uh, this pa the, the panel that put this, this report together and I guess they wanted to get ambitious so they put this here, you know, in, in 10 years time the vision is that these S2S forecasts will be as widely used uh, as, as weather forecasts are today. So uh, I think, you know, this, this is something that maybe it's possible and uh, lots of work to do this. And so they put in this, this graphic, some of the things that, you know, that are needed to get there. And these are some of the things I'll talk about also in the S2S project, how do we increase the skill of the forecast and uh, improve early warning of events? Uh, how do we, uh, you know, uh, improve, improve the models, improve the forecast, and really connect uh, through products, through how, how we connect the, the outputs from these, these atmospheric forecasting models with, with, with user needs. Uh, what, I thought I should just put up, you know, what is S2S here? In the sub-seasonal, the seasonal prediction project of the WMO, we, we define this as roughly two weeks to a season, so between a weather forecast and a seasonal forecast. In this academy report, it's, it, it's slightly longer, out to 12 months. Sort of, so it's sort of, it's slightly grey, in, including the, the seasonal forecasting. And you can see that many of the, the the same sources of predictability really overlap here. So I mean, it's, it's well motivated. So I'll talk about uh, just to set the scene in terms of weather and uh, climate prediction. Then uh, fill you in a bit on, on updates from, from this uh, S international S2S project and uh, say a few words about uh, on, on, the, on the water context. Okay, so I'll start with a slide of uh, Dwayne's here that I think nicely encapsulates uh, where S2S sits in this sort of gap between, oops, so sorry. Weather forecasting, we all know weather forecasting out to roughly, roughly a week, 10 days in advance. Uh, you know, roots going back to uh, the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, we're, we're, I think it's fair to say we're pretty good at this. We, there's a good, especially in the middle latitudes, we, we know how to predict the evolution of, of uh, baroclinic waves. Uh, then on the seasonal time scale, we've been doing this for some time too, since the, since the mid 80s or so in terms of uh, seasonal outlooks. We, these are much more probabilistic, what we can say about the season as a whole in terms of likelihood of it being wetter or drier than normal, warmer or, or cooler than normal. Um, but what can we say? And, and we've got a good source of predictability there in terms of ENSO. So here you can say, you know, we've got we've, our source of predictability is a baroclinic waves in the middle latitudes. Here it's ENSO. But uh, what about in the middle? What can we, what, why is it that we have uh, the situation where we, we, we see our, our weather forecasts on, on, on the TV like this. And if you go to various websites like, like CPC or IRI 
or many centers around the world, you can find these seasonal outlooks, but you can't find much uh, in between. But why, why is that? So here's my little little take on it, on this uh, gray area in between here in, in the sub-seasonal uh, time scale. So the weather is more or less an initial value problem of, of uh, forecasting uh, this uh, you know, baroclinic wave de development, weather, weather development, or you know, easterly waves in the tropics, uh, atmospheric uh, uh, African easterly waves, for example, uh, on da daily time scale. Uh, the climate is much more of a boundary value problem for the atmosphere's point of view. Uh, how do the sea surface temperature anomalies or, or uh, other surface anomalies impact on the atmosphere? And they, they can tilt the odds in one way or the other, or as you go out to longer time scales, atmospheric composition. As in the middle here, uh, then it's really a mix of this in, is an initial value problem and boundary value problem, which is, you know, makes it somewhat more difficult, and then maybe more sources of predictability coming in here. Uh, one thing that's that uh, uh, are uh, really shared uh, as you get away from the daily weather time scales is this role of, uh, I get into the more climate time scale, is the role of time averaging. So it's a key thing when we, when we think of the seasonal forecasting, we're typically averaging over three months because we need to average out the, 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 the weather noise and just see how the, the sea surface temperatures are tilting those odds. But even as, as we go down to the sub-seasonal, it's also, we're, we're thinking there as well in terms of this sort of predictability of the second kind, that you can say something about the, the characteristics of the weather, but, but it starts to become much more probabilistic. So we may not be averaging over three months, but we're still averaging over some, uh, some period, or, or we're looking at, well, what are the statistics within a week, for, for example. Uh, this is a, a slide from the, uh, the NOAA, NOAA's uh, Modeling and Analysis Prediction and Projections Program. They have, a, a, they have a, an initiative on, on a research to, on, on S2S, a, 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 a prediction task force, and they put this nice, uh, nice graphic together uh, showing well, the just the complexity, really, of all the, the sources of predictability that, that come into play on this, on the uh, this intervening time scale between weather and climate. So, uh, sorry, I keep doing that one time. You still have ENSO, but you have other things coming in: the Madden and Julian oscillation, maybe the stratospheric polar vortex, the NAO teleconnection patterns, but also surface memory of land surface conditions, maybe sea ice, uh, things like that. Uh, modes of atmospheric variability to do with to do with uh, atmospheric uh, atmospheric uh, Rossby waves so it, it's a more complex situation in terms of in terms of the modeling and prediction perhaps than we have uh, in, in on the weather and the the, uh, the seasonal seasonal time scale how are we doing in terms of forecast skill uh, on those scales or across all the scales so I think this is, a, I put this one up here showing what we, the way that people uh, describe how well we're doing for weather forecasts uh, typically tends to be something like this, where they'll, where they'll look at anomaly correlation of uh, 500, 500 millibar geopotential height uh, uh, anomalies, 12 months, 12 months running means. And we'll tend to look at something like this, uh, an evolution, so it's something very broad scale uh, and show how uh, this has been improving over time. So uh, for the 10-day uh, the, the forecast uh, today, uh, are, you know, where we were uh, maybe uh, back, in the, back in the 80s for the 7-day forecast, but it tends to be in terms of something like geopotential height. Whereas the seasonal forecast, this is the way that that, that will be characterized. This is something from the IRI. Uh, really much more from a user point of view, uh, this is, uh, the skill uh, in terms of how much, what would be the rate of return uh, on, on using such forecasts. And uh, one sees uh, at regions where, where, where it's good and regions where, where it's less good. So what, you know, where, where are, what, what happens in between? This is from a, a, an earlier paper of ours, just I think gives a nice flavor of uh, 
going from across the weeks, I said that you know on, on the subseasonal time scale we're more more interested we're, we're the, well, our targets get shorter than for the the seasonal one where we're looking at three month averages. So I'm showing here just weekly averages of precipitation skill from the ECMWF model, and you can see uh, lots of sorry. red means good skill. You can see in that that first week. The uh, information from the initial conditions is very strong, but already at week two, you're losing a lot of that. But you can see there are some red areas that persist through the four weeks. And uh, they're, not, they're not everywhere. You can see the, the, this region here. It's the, the, it's the, 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 the role, the, the signature of uh, ENSO that's coming through, even on these sub-seasonal time scales. But then also you can look, you see this, uh, this region around the Indian Ocean, Western Pacific, that's actually the, the MJO that's coming through there. So as with seasonal forecasts, with sub-seasonal, it's, uh, it's, not, it's, not, it's not everywhere that, that, we, that we can expect to have skill. Uh, this is zooming in more over the US in terms of uh, it was this ECMWF model again, uh, precipitation skill atop uh, winter, uh, spring, summer, and, and fall at the bottom. Uh, here's precipitation, temperature in the middle, and geopotential on the right. So the main thing I want to point out here is that across the variables, again, uh, there's much, this much higher skill in geopotential. It's also regional. There are, there are regions that have better skill than others, and, and seasons that have better skill. It tends to be more skillful in winter, uh, for example, in precip. And I thought I'd just show a result here. This is from the uh, uh, SubEx project. Uh, that's uh, uh, another subseasonal season. That's really the subseasonal season initiative uh, funded, funded uh, interagency-wise uh, in the US. Uh, they, it's showing here uh, a result of looking averaged over the, over the US at some of those scores. And they're showing here, this is a multi-model ensemble. They, they've put together a database also of many many models here and showing that a multi-model ensemble is actually uh, improving on any individual model, which is something we've seen uh, on the seasonal time scale. So I'll say a few words now about the, this S2S project of the WMO. Uh, its, its goals are to improve the forecast skill. Oops. An understanding on, on uh, the sub-seasonal to seasonal time scale with special emphasis on high impact weather events. Uh, promote the initiative's uptake uh, by operational centers and exploitations by the application community and really to capitalize on, on expertise in the weather and climate research communities. So I think that's a, that's a big opportunity here uh, that, that we have in S2S is really bringing together you know, uh, expertise and different methodologies that have been used both in, in modeling, uh, both in, in post-processing, verification and things like this in the weather and climate communities to see how we can, uh, what should really be done on these intermediate timescales. So this project uh, started about five years ago and so we're just coming to the end of the, the first phase of it. And one of the, the, the main thing has been, it's been creation of a, of a database of uh, 11 global uh, producing uh, center, uh, WMO global producing center models. So this is a weather services around the world uh, at all these centers and they've, they've been archived at ECMWF, uh, at CMA in China, and uh, also we have them at the IRI now uh, as well. Uh, we have the full set of hindcasts, reef forecasts over past years, as well as the, the forecasts in, in real time uh, but they, these are delayed by three weeks before real time, behind the real time. That's an important point because uh, some of the, some of the, of the uh, operational interests of, of the centers. There's a strong linkage in the S2S project with the WMO's operational arm or with their commission for, for basic systems. Uh, and so uh, the idea is to, to, uh, that they can get access to this database without any uh, without delay and develop products 
that then can be shared with the, the national met, met services. So the way that research uh, was uh, organized in the, in the S2S project in its first, first five years was uh, to identify all these kinds of issues that were also in that, that, uh, that first, first slide graphic that I showed in terms of the various modeling issues. Uh, what do we need to do to improve the forecast through the model? How do we initialize? How do we uh, generate the ensembles? Because ensembles are, uh, are generated typically in, in these models from, from the weather, from the weather uh, point of view. Uh, what resolution do we need? Uh, do we need to, what's, what's the role of ocean atmosphere coupling, things like that? Uh, what are the main sources of predictability? And how can we, in this, this last column here, how can we connect uh, with, with uh, application? And some of these topics here, uh, teleconnections, Madden-Julian oscillation, that's been a big one, uh, monsoons, how can, how can uh, uh, African Met services make use of these? What about extremes? And how to, how to uh, document how well we're, we're doing with, with these forecasts? And I think quite a bit of, uh, 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 there's been a lot of progress in, in the first five years. Uh, putting that data out there has been a huge catalyst uh, for people to be able to actually, you know, look at how well, uh, what the skill of these forecasts is. So just a, a couple, of, couple of results from the project. Uh, MJO prediction, that's where, that's really what I think you could say led to the research, research, uh, resurgence of interest uh, in this intermediate time scale. And why there wasn't anything you could say before is because those sources of predictability, uh, specifically, you know, the MJO, the stratosphere, were not well treated uh, by the models. And uh, a big change has been that the, the, the MJO is now much be better represented and much better forecast uh, in, in models. And this has important teleconnections, so also important for the middle latitude. So it's just showing that actually you have uh, a uh, good skill out to three or four weeks in, in man, many of these models uh, in MJO prediction, and then this translates into into things like uh, things like a North Atlantic oscillation teleconnection pattern. But to say you know one of the challenges is there are still you know important systematic errors and biases in these patterns. So in order to be able to really capitalize on how well you can predict the MJO, so you have to capitalize on that in middle latitudes. You also have to be able to get the teleconnections right. The stratosphere, uh, there's been, there's, there's, there's more and more interest in that and how, uh, for example, sudden stratosp stratospheric warmings uh, can uh, boost the skill. So this is a case where, where you have a weak vortex versus a normal vortex, uh, giving, giving you enhanced, enhanced skill from that uh, several weeks later. So just to uh, tell you a little bit about the, the second phase of the SOS, and I, obviously I don't want to go uh, through this in too much detail. How am I doing for time, actually? Five more minutes. Okay, I'll just say that we, we did a kind of gap analysis to see, well, you know, have people been using, the, have people been finding uh, the, 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 the results of the SOS project so far, and what should we focus on? Uh, and this is things like, uh, frequently mentioned gaps, land surface processes, ensemble generation, uh, initialization, some of the things like this. Uh, we need more faster uh, access to popular suites of variables like, uh, like, like weekly averages, things like that. Uh, we need more calibrated products, much more work needed on, on products. I'll skip along. We, we asked uh, people in, in user sectors and they said, uh, well, uh, Accuracy of the forecast is still lacking. Uh, we need more post-processing. We need to be able to better connect the, the models with or using by, by product development with uh, user user relevant variables. So for our for our plan for phase two, which is actually kicking off at the beginning of January next year, so this is all very timely for that. I'm really looking forward to your 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 the input today for for, the, for feedback onto our plans in the second phase of the, of, of the project uh, to enhance the database, uh, new research foci, uh, in particular, uh, the, the roles of the ocean and, land, and, and sea ice, land surface, stratosphere, atmospheric composition of the aerosols, ensemble generation, and enhancing the operational uh, infrastructure and really going to much more toward, uh, toward application. 
So, so I thought I would uh, just say one thing about the land surface, since I think that's a, be a common common topic today uh, with, with, the, with, the, with the water board. We have a, a sub-project on this. This is from Paul Dillemeyer. And some of the, the phase two questions will be, uh, what's the impact of the observing system on land, land initialization? Can we better initialize the land? Uh, how well are the coupled land ocean lands or land atmosphere processes represented in the models? And uh, how might uh, land anomalies in particular uh, contribute to, to extremes? And it's really seen as a kind of sweet spot in here for land, where I talked about atmospheric initial conditions for weather and more ocean ENSO for seasonal forecasting. But uh, maybe for land, there's a kind of sweet spot in between here that is an important source of predictability that hasn't yet been, been fully exploited uh, in the model. And we can do a, a lot to improve, improve, on, improve on that. So operational infrastructure, just to really here, I think a key point is to uh, accelerate development of things like, well, we have all the, the ensemble output from these models, but how can we calibrate bias correct, uh, downscale uh, that toward product that, that can really inform these decisions? And, uh, one thing we want to do down at the bottom here is to establish a, a pilot, a real, what we call a real-time pilot program for S2S applications to really catalyze work across uh, various sectors on, on, on um, demonstrating skills in, in user, user decision context. So the idea is, that we, is to do this, make the forecast available in real time for one to two years uh, to a, 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 a subgroup of people. Of, of projects that are already underway, basically. So just getting to at the end here toward, well, uh, how do we use that information? Uh, just flashing this one up to say, uh, we, get, we get more specific information as we go from seasonal to, to weather, but the sub-seasonal is really coming in here and it's really a key time in many user decisions, uh, you know, between the less than 10 days and, and the, the three to six months. But many user decisions fall in that range. In the water context, so I just took this out of uh, uh, your nice report. Uh, some of the issues I'm sure will be discussed a lot today. Uh, water supply management, including flood control uh, and drought. So what's the probability of, of heavy rainfall and runoff? Uh, atmospheric rivers, for example, snowpack, uh, snow melt. Uh, reservoir operations, hydropower scheduling, supply and demand also. Uh, temperature forecast can, can come into that. Mm -hmm. And I put at the bottom also this that I already mentioned, you know, this really important role for, for how do we connect uh, between the, the climate model output and, and the water uh, decision making in terms of you know, bias correction with the quantile mapping, regression, uh, or downscaling, something we haven't really uh, discussed very much in the S2S project to date. Uh, I thought I would just flash a couple of things up, up at the end here. So this is from, from Dwayne's group at, at uh, uh, JPL, and there's a lot of interest in the room here with, with Janine being here, uh, people from the West in terms of atmospheric <laughs> river prediction. So to say there's work going on, uh, this is connected to the S2S project, be one of this real-time uh, pilot applications to predict, to be able to forecast the, the number of atmospheric river events. And maybe someone is going to show a slide on this, this later. Uh, this is some of our own work looking at large-scale atmospheric patterns, we call the weather regimes. Uh, can we say something about, uh, the, can we forecast these uh, large-scale patterns which could inform various sectors? And what I'm showing here is an, an analysis of the, the identify these patterns, four patterns over the Pacific and North America. And particularly, I draw your uh, attention to this one, this one with a ridge over the West Coast. That's this regime one that's, that's in red here on this chart. And this is showing in real time from the beginning of October uh, which regime we've been under. And you can see that, that we've been under this West Coast Ridge a lot of the time, which has for sure been associated with all the, 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 the fire, uh, the, the extreme fire uh, events in, in California. And what's showing up the, uh, uh, in the vertical is how well that could be predicted uh, by, the, by the CFSB2 model. And you, we can see that if, if you have vertical bars, it means it could be uh, it, it was predicted well out, up to that lead time. So you could see we have, we have skill out to about 10 days or something, tending to lose it after. Maybe it's a little bit up here. Uh, and this is 
being produced at the IRI now in real time. So I encourage you uh, to, to look at this or get in touch with me. Very, very uh, much interested in, 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 in this. We can see that we have just in the last few days gone over into this blue, which is this more Pacific trough uh, El Nino type of pattern. So the, that's uh, uh, also was, was forecast out to about uh, 10 days in advance. So what you can see in such plots is uh, the evolution of the season so far in terms of these large scale patterns uh, and how well they've been forecast to date. And, what, and also if you look up this, uh, the diagonal, that's the forecast. So you can see that the forecast at the moment is to stay more or less uh, in this Pacific trough uh, regime. So uh, almost at the end now, uh, some, some things on, on product development. Uh, these are uh, forecast maps coming out for week three, week four outlooks uh, from, from CTC, which sure you're, you're, you're familiar with already. This is a, a product that we're also making at, at the IRI in terms of turfile uh, categories. This, looks, this is the same kind of style that we have in our seasonal forecast. What's the probability of, of below normal rainfall, above normal rainfall? This is a calibrated sub-X project, pro product that's coming from that, that uh, uh, NOAA su sub-X project. Uh, so showing uh, above normal, below normal. So this is something that's, that we're now experimentally making in, in real time. So I think there's starting to be more and more products out there uh, that, are, that are available to people to look at uh, on, uh, to, to uh, on, on this time scale. What should the window be? Maybe there's a final one there. So it's, 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 we're thinking of seasonal, seamless. We're going from just daily, daily values on the weather scale to three month averages. What should the window be? Maybe you can have a sort of, kind of sliding uh, seamless window as you, as you go to longer lead where you, you expand the window in time. Interesting idea, I think. So just in summary, I think this is really an emerging area still, uh, the sub-season to seasonal. Uh, improving forecast capabilities, I hope I've uh, shown you something of that, and also given you an, an idea of that, that you know, product development is underway, but still much more is needed. Uh, bringing together weather and climate, how should we, what should a product look like on those timescales in terms of you know, weather products versus seasonal forecast products towards more seamless, uh, prediction across scales. Uh, creation of these databases has been a, a big impetus. Uh, and, you know, kudos to, to Noah and others in the US for, for making the seasonal uh, North American multi-model ensemble uh, uh, database available, making it available in real time. And now we have the sub-X. Hopefully this can be continued. Remember that one is in, in real time. Uh, the S2S database coming from the S2S project. Uh, in, in our project, I think there's a there's really, uh, since we're just starting the second phase of the project in January, there's a lot of scope for, uh, you know, feedback from the community, from you and others on how those, how those, fo how those new foci go forward in terms of uh, getting better, <coughs> better uh, forecasts from the sources of predictability in the, the slowly varying surface conditions ocean sea ice, land surface, uh, impact of stratosphere, how can prognostic aerosols uh, improve forecast? And then how can we better you know, generate the ensemble product development? I mentioned this real-time pilot where the sub-seasonal database will be made available in real time. And it's, it's delayed by three weeks behind real time to a, a set of demonstration projects but the line again, the SubEx project has, has already, already demonstrated uh, as is S2S the value of multimodal combination. So I think that having these multimodal databases is very, very important. Uh, many opportunities in the water sector for, for us to discuss today uh, and the challenges of integrating that probabilistic forecast information across these lead times from days to weeks to months uh, to head, help mitigate a, 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 a a range of hazards, and, and we'll see that uh, much more work. Uh, again, I hope I've emphasized that on, on things like the post processing, bias correction, calibration, downscaling uh, towards sector specific variables uh, and models. And then finally, we had a, we had a great conference at, uh, at NCAR S2S, 
with S2D together, there's a huge interest in the community, uh, also of this sort of uh, seamless uh, paradigm that has also been taken up in a big way by the WMO. If you want to learn more about S2S projects, uh, there's, uh, there's a website, s2sprediction.net, there's a, there's a newsletter on that. And finally, we just published a book actually, uh, by Vitar and myself, uh, with, uh, on the topic that just came out. So uh, I, hope I, I hope this has been useful and uh, appreciate any comments, any, any questions, anything I can do to clarify. I'm very much looking forward to the discussion throughout the day. Thank you. Okay, lots of information to digest there. Do we have some questions? Please um, put your card up and I will try to keep uh, an order. So, um, go ahead, John. Yeah, um, Mike and name, please. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dave Titley, Penn State. So thanks. I thought that was a tremendous presentation. Thanks so much. Thanks. On your graphic that you showed the predictability of atmosphere, land, and ocean, where, where would the cryosphere fit into that? Where would ice be on that, if, if you have any thoughts on that? Thanks. It would be, it would be both at the sub-seasonal as well as the, uh, the, the seasonal. That would be what you're saying. So it, it, it would not just be sub it would be... Uh, on, on more on a, on a longer on a longer breadth of time scale, but sub seasonal would would be part of it. Um, Dave, Bid, and then Sushi, and then Jonathan. Thank you, Andy. Wonderful presentation. A lot of material to digest before lunch. Sorry if it was too much. <laughs> but I have a question uh, related to, you mentioned uh, El Nino, La Nina a couple of times. Is that, part, is that phenomenon, that time scale and space scale phenomenon, part of this, uh, your S2S study? Or is it, yeah, and, yes. and then if you say yes, I have a follow-on. Yeah, yeah, yes it is. Uh, okay. Especially over, over Australia, people have been finding that a lot of the scale in the sub-seasonal forecast is really coming from, from ENSO. Yeah, I know. Uh, so my question is, uh, is your group going to investigate the poor uh, uh, predictions that were made in 2014, 2015, that the community at large said there's going to be a big El Nino, but it came a year later. So in some sense, they were correct if you don't worry about time scales within a year or so. I'm being facetious. So is, is it your group or some other group? That's, because you mentioned specific phenomena, and then you also mentioned we need to do better on just the regular determination of all the variables in the atmosphere, yeah. which are two separate things. Right. So I mean, within the WMO system, there's a working group on sub-seasonal to interdecadal uh, prediction and predictability, WGSIP. And it's really their, their purview, especially on the, on the seasonal scale. The, 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 the niche that I see, so the, the S2S project, is in uh, looking at the role of what the shorter timescale variability is, is, how is that impacting on the lack of skill that we're seeing at the, sub, at the seasonal timescale. So if you look at the winter of 2015-2016, of it, was, it was grossly over forecast to, to, to have El Nino conditions with wet, wet in, in Southern California. That didn't pan out. But if you look, if you look at one of uh, those, that, that kind of plot that I showed, uh, that uh, we call this, uh, Mike Tippett calls these uh, chiclets plots. Uh, you can see that there's a heck of a, lot, heck of a lot of blue in there at the seasonal, on, at the seasonal lead time. So the models were really, uh, you know, predicting strongly that it was going to be. Uh, canonical El Nino uh, impacts pattern. But what actually happens is when you get down to the, the lead times, you know, in, in 10 to, to, to 15 days, you see that, well, that these sub-seasonal scales became, started to become important. And uh, there was predictability on those time scales that you could see those as noise in terms of, uh, you know, the seasonal forecast. So uh, what I think I want to try and say is that the S2S uh, can, 
provides a way to see it sort of holistically in terms of if there's a bad prediction coming from, of, from the uh, a bad ENSO prediction, why why was that? Is that because of other other phenomena playing a role on on the subsignal scale? I'm not sure if that answers your question quite, but. Uh, Yeah, thank you for your presentation. Um, I have a question. Um, hope it's in spirit of learning from our sister board of uh, um, water colleagues about what are the quantity or things we forecast that can speak to broader community in some ways. Maybe I'll start with prediction of precipitation. Uh, so in the weather regime, we usually like to think the next day or two, a couple of days down the road, we'll call the uh, quantitative precipitation forecast, the QPF. So that has specific meanings at each location. By the time we get into seasonal, the current uh, way of looking at it is the outlook, either above normal or below normal. Then seasonal, the sub-seasonal part of this, it's sort of in this zone, um, I wonder if you can give us some sort of a um, quantitative description about what should we expect from QBF to this outlook? Is there something can be specifically looking down the road the next few years to be an improvement from above normal, below normal, or some sort of a QBF? So I think that, that's, a, that's, a great, that's a great comment. And uh, I think it, it's really something that uh, you know we're we're only starting to grapple with now, and that point comes out of this slide where if we look at the, the week three four outlooks from CPC, and if you look at the way that we've been doing the same thing as also week three week four at the IRI, it's in terms of these above normal below normal. Uh, this is precipitation at every point, the probability, but it's it, it's just below, above normal below normal. Or we have another product where you can look at the PDF itself. So you can say, well, what's the probability of being above a certain threshold, uh, something like that, which maybe move, moves more in that direction. And in our seasonal forecast, we, we also have that. But it, it's very much in terms of, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're looking at odds over some, some window period. And it could be it could be the average in a, in a week, or it could be, well, what's the probability of having a number of days, uh, a number of extreme days, or things like that, which is also something that's lent from the seasonal side. So in seasonal forecasting, we talk about weather within climate, and can we say something about the number of dry days in the season or something like that, uh, those, those kinds of statistics. So, I mean, I guess I come from the seasonal side, uh, seasonal forecasting side, so I'm biased, but I see you know, there's, there's, there's a lot of work on taking those methodologies from the seasonal forecasting and uh, translating them onto the sub-seasonal scale where we just make the, the, the window, uh, uh, we just make the window shorter, essentially. But I think your point is also getting toward, well, on the weather forecast side, we have these things every day and that sort of envelope is, is going out to, into the medium range. Is there some way that we can go more seamlessly uh, between those and uh, you know maybe it sort of gets to that 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 kind of a uh, what's encapsulated here in, in terms of what, what does a product look like on this F2S scale? Yeah, thank you, Andrew. Um, could you comment on the role of uh, linear inverse modeling in the S2S universe? Yeah, thanks. So in, in the S2S universe, I can say from the S2S project side, I mean, obviously from what I've, what I've been talking about, it's, it's a coordination of uh, global producing centers using ensemble prediction systems. So it is heavily biased. The work has been heavily biased in that direction. But there's very interesting work coming out of the, of the, uh, the, the, the reduced uh, inverse modeling uh, linear inverse model community, particularly from you know, Matt Newman and, and others uh, in, in Boulder. And he was, he, he was showing them at our meeting in, 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 in Boulder and, 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 and in Santa Barbara as well, how uh, using such models, you, you can also get, uh, you can get a skillful forecast that may, may rival the, the global, the ensemble prediction systems. So I think they play, firstly, they play a very important role in terms of providing 
benchmarks. So a baseline, you should be able to beat, you know, what a linear inverse model can, can tell you. That they can also uh, elucidate the, the dynamics, what's, what's going on, where, where's the, what are the sources of predictability. And uh, in, in certain cases, they, 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 may be, they may be useful as predictive tools. And I think there's not enough work that's been done uh, on, on, on that. And I think in, in our S2S project, it's something that we, we need more of. Thank you for that. Um, next, Mark, and then we'll finish with Ravi. Thank you, Kathy. Um, you, one of the questions I had as you were presenting, and then you said you kind of dismissed it as the, as the downscaling. Um, you know, the, the maps you show, pretty much Western United States is going to be above or below normal. Um, what, what's, what's the progress and what, what's your, for, your forecast <laughs> uh, for uh, having that, that, that resolution be able to see this at least maybe even on a, on a, on a watershed basis, for example, to know that, you know, that uh, a particular basin may be more, uh, more above or below normal rather than, you know, such, such a large scale. And, and, and so what, what's being done and what, what's your, your forecast? On? Yeah, so, so to be honest, in, in S2S, in the first phase, it's really been focused on looking at the larger scales, what's the skill on, on larger scales. And in fact, the, the, uh, the, the, the data in that database was all coarse grain to one and a half degrees. So uh, we don't have the fine scale information, even if the ECMWF model is, is uh, you know, tens of kilometers in, in resolution. So I think there's a, there's a lot of work to be done there on, on how to downscale. Uh, should it be uh, what models to use, uh, li li linking with uh, you know, region, limited area atmospheric models toward hydrologic models, or are there ways to uh, statistically uh, calibrate and, and downscale using quant quantile mapping? People have been using that, or re regression methods that identify uh, a decision variable, uh, maybe it's uh, on, on your, your basin scale, and then regress that onto the, those, the, the larger scales that are, are, are predictable uh, in the model. So identifying you know, what's the predictable scales in, on, in, the atmosphere, in the atmosphere and then relating those to the, 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 uh, the hydrologic basin scale. But I think there's, there's, there's uh, important work to be done both on, on uh, that kind of more uh, statistical approach versus you know, really uh, coupling or, or, or not coupling is the wrong word, but, but uh, interfacing the, 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 the large scale models with limited, limited area modeling. It's not something that's, that's being done very much, or we haven't really, we don't have a sub project, for example, on that in, in S2S. It's not mm. something that that uh, particular, uh, that our group has, uh, uh, is, is focusing on very strongly. Although we have heard, uh, you know, that, that many, that, that there's a lot of, lot of interest in that. So you don't foresee that, that's not in your vision, your 10 year vision to make this, this kind of practical applications. Uh, our, our five, it's a five year vision now since we, we, we're, we're halfway through. <laughs> but the, the five year vision in, in terms of uh, demonstrations is to, is I think through this, I mean it's through those foci, research foci and so forth that I mentioned. That, I mean downscaling isn't one of those but within the real time pilot, if we can identify some groups that are already working on, on in that, in that uh, domain, then, then that would be an opportunity to, to, uh, to catalyze that. Okay, great. Did you have a quick related to this? I'm gonna make a comment that um, there's another world climate research program called CORDEX, the Coordinated Regional Downscaling Experiment that's really designed for climate, longer time at climb scales. And there would be a natural marriage that we started to think about between S2S <laughs> and Cordex at some point. There could be some natural ways of bringing those together in the future that might right. provide downscaling to the S2S timescale. Thank, Thank you. Very so helpful. Well. Yeah, great. And um, Ravi will have the last question, and then we'll move to our next speaker. Thank you. Um, I'm going to be a little provocative, just to kind of go, where are, I shouldn't say we, you compared to farmer's almanac in predicting <laughs> precipitation. I'm just actually. <laughs> well, we, you know, at, at IRI on the seasonal forecasting, we've been fighting against the, the farmer's almanac for, for 20 years. 
And we do think that we're quite a bit better than that. And, uh, you know, that the map that I showed at the beginning on seasonal forecast skill is, is an expression of that. There's been a lot of, a lot of verification done on real-time seasonal forecasting. Uh, so I, I think that, uh, you know, there's a lot being done in the seasonal community. It's just starting to be done now on these sub-seasonal timescales. And I showed a, a couple of examples, but I think, you know, with, the, with these databases becoming available also in the, the SubEx project, they've been doing a, a, a ton of work. Uh, that's just been a, a two-year project on, on, on looking at the skill of uh, those, those, those US and, uh, models of, uh, over North America. I don't know if that answers the question. <laughs> One way of hedging it, isn't it? Yeah. Thank you very much. Oh, we really appreciate that. Really fantastic. And uh, next, um, we have uh, Ying Fan from Rutgers University. And I'll let um, uh, Dr. Reinbelder introduce herself as well. And um, take it away, please. Okay, my name is Yingfan Reinfelder. I'm a professor at Rutgers University in the Earth and Planetary Science uh, Department. I'm a hydrologist and I do very large scale uh, water cycle models, really from the perspective of a water cycle impact on the water energy and carbon cycle. Uh, so some, I'm somewhere in between those two boxes. So on the, uh, on the right and on the, on the left, uh, where's the pointer? Oh, here's the pointer. Uh, this is the, the, what Kathy said, the, the, the weather and the climate uh, world, where we have uh, kind of a vertical water, and, and to be fair, atmospheric is totally 3D. Uh, so, you know, and, but, but, but it's more 3D than, than land, actually, and because they go to kilometers up, we only go to a few hundred meters down. Uh, but, if, but we're here uh, as land dwellers and looking up, and we need liquid fresh water, and this is what uh, the atmosphere gives us this um, how much it wants back. Uh, basically, that's how we view the, the weather uh, system. So I think that vertical water is not really a fair statement. And, and but this vertical, but again, we're going to come back to land and pretend that we're just land creatures. We cannot move anywhere else. We cannot fly. We cannot dive. And so then we can look at the water as, as 2D. And in this supply and demand from the uh, weather climate side, uh, actually gets redistributed on land uh, in a 3D fashion, not just horizontal water, but also goes down into aquifers and come back up. So it's entirely also 3D. Uh, but again, from the, if you're a climate scientist, you look at land, a land is 2D, and right? You give us uh, evaporation, we give you water, you give us evaporation that drives the boundary layer dynamics, thermodynamics. And so it depends on who, which side you are, we're all 3D. But again, we're going to stay on this side, on the water side, because this meeting is about water. And so we can think of land as 3D and uh, the atmosphere as 1D, up and down. And uh, uh, there is, there is uh, a lot in between. And so I'm working really somewhere in between. And so, um, uh, again, I'm trying to figure out this. Okay, so first I want to start by saying that uh, we do, as a community, uh, a beautiful job in really predicting the atmospheric water balance, the up and down fluxes. I'm sorry, sh shown here, let me go back again. I'm going to get used to this for a little bit. Uh, so we have this, uh, okay, it's not moving anymore. Okay, I'm going to go back one more time and then go do this again. Okay, so it's moving. So you, this is an old model simulation. This is the NCAR uh, CCSM, uh, this about 10 years ago simulation. This is the water vapor moving uh, in the atmosphere. The white is the evaporation, and then the orange and red are precipitation. Basically, you have the up and the down fluxes. And this is hourly time step for 10 years. You can see uh, the, the, all the seasonal and, uh, and the, you know, hourly uh, dynamics of the atmosphere. And we do a beautiful job because the climate scientists are really, really organized. And they put their community uh, wit into a, a field, a limited number of models. And they uh, really do a fantastic job. But the hydrology side, not so. Uh, so this, this beautiful job of vertical water flux 
do not really give us a full picture of hydrology because they're not designed to do so. They are weather and climate models, and the land is a boundary condition. And so as a boundary condition, then you get the skin right, and you pretty, pretty much do a good job uh, getting the land surface feedback back. And so that's what it's done. And so it does a good job for the climate models, but these models are by design not built to forecast hydrology. Uh, so you can, you can see that they usually have a very large land slab, a few degrees, and Andy was saying that model 1.5 degrees, that's 150 uh, kilometers wide. And then the thickness is only about two to three meters because that's the boundary condition, that's the skin. And then uh, the water that goes through this skin will get into the rivers and come somehow routed out. And so, uh, so it doesn't really have the, the so-called meat and potatoes of hydrology. And hydrology is to think of the land as, you know, we have topography, water flows downhill, you have this lateral flow, you also have a vertical flow going down and come back up, and then that's the near the surface, and deeper down we have uh, aquifers, that's where most of our water is, it's aquifers. And this, these two pictures from the left side and right side are very different. Uh, so the difference, uh, for example, is that these models are very, very shallow. They are only two to three uh, meters. And groundwater goes to hundreds of meters. And the, uh, the almond uh, orchards were in California irrigated by water 400 meters deep. Uh, so that's where we, came, we get our water to put on the land surface and evaporate. And so that is the, the depth side. And then the horizontal scales are very, also very different. And then most uh, climate weather models, I'm sorry, have a, um, a very um, sort of a flat, big slab uh, without uh, the, the local hydrologic processes. And on land, from the ridge to the valley, it's only about tens of meters, hundreds of meters, uh, and most. And so horizontally, they cannot resolve the processes that generate our stream flows. And then um, really another important um, missing of the meat and potato is there's no groundwater. Uh, the water leaks through in those, in those models, in climate weather models and move into rivers and without a groundwater storage. Uh, so we, our most, as I said, most of our water comes from our aquifers and without the aquifers, um, we, our, our groundwater is not there and our wetlands cannot be supported. Our low flow, when it doesn't rain, uh, the flow forecast cannot be um, served because, you know, our rivers are flowing for days and weeks and months without rain and that water comes from groundwater. So this is really the importance of bringing groundwater into uh, this framework. And so, so what do we do, right? Uh, this is a, this difference has a historic reason and for a good reason, uh, but now we really wanted to, to know, you know, from weather uh, to climate models and to today's earth system models, integrated uh, impact analysis models, those models participate in IPCC, they forecast the water resource change into the future. And these models don't really have the hydrology meat and potatoes, the hydrologists would like and the land water managers and on the ground would like to know. And so they don't have this kind of information. So what do we do? And this difference will continue. These two different water world vertical versus uh, this, this land 3D model will continue. So what, uh, how do we make hydrologic forecasts? That's our question, right? These models cannot directly give us uh, the information we want on land. So what can we do? So I'm going to briefly talk about the two general approaches and then where we are, what are the challenges, and going forward, what we can do. Uh, so the first very common approach is to use the climate model output and then drive an offline hydrology model. This is the common practice. We've seen uh, hundreds of papers uh, in the literature. And then second uh, approach is to bring hydrologic processes into weather and climate models in a simple way, but it captures the fundamental processes. So, so th those are the two um, sort of approaches I'm going to briefly discuss. Uh, discuss. Okay, so approach number one, basically using the climate model output, you give me the supply and the demand, I'm going to drive a uh, fine scale, fine grid uh, land hydrology model. Uh, there are 
many, many hydrology models. You can pick one and then use those coarse grade uh, climate downscaling present and the future and drive your hydrology models. That can have rivers and hill slopes and farmlands and irrigation and aquifers. Uh, so this is a very common approach and very successful approach in many ways. Uh, it can cover regional to local uh, watershed scales and, uh, and really, um, those models are built uh, from local agencies, state and county uh, water management area uh, level. So you can directly involve stakeholders. And so you have a targeted uh, sort of a problem driven uh, model that can give you the information you want. And you can also constrain the model better with the local observations. You can get the observations you need to constrain your model, you calibrate your model. Uh, so this is, those are the, the, really the pros. You can really have a very useful model for your local uh, place. And, but the cons is that um, we have just a patchwork hydrologic models. Unlike climate models, there are virtually hundreds of hydrologic models. And every research group likes to de develop their own hydrology models. So there are just way too many models and very confusing designed for different purposes, and depending on who you talk to, you get a model to use. And so, and it's very costly because you recalibrate, rebuild a model, labor and the computation and data intensive. We waste, we waste a lot of energy by doing this patchwork models, and it's very hard to compare across the board. Uh, you know, for federal agencies to make decisions, uh, for FEMA, for example, it is, who do you listen to? They use, use different models. And so, um, I mean, I was talking to Dave Maidman, a colleague at um, UT Austin. He said in Texas alone, for river forecast, there are over 60 models, 60, 60. And so depending on which agency you talk to and which uh, research firm you, you, you talk to, they all have different models. So this really, really disorganized hydrologic landscape uh, is the, the main issue. So then the question is, uh, can we do better? Uh, I think so. And everybody knows in this room, we need integrate, we need to organize. The hydrology academic community should really follow the climate and weather community example and get organized and develop those uh, Integrated, you know, from all the uh, radius zone soil that supports crops and our forests and to aquifers and to rivers and wetlands and the quality and the quantity. All these things we need to have some kind of integrated modeling framework. And, and also we need to have multi scale so that we can serve the nation with a consistent uh, framework as well as have the local details that can be useful for local problem solving. And we need to provide these parameters and we need to have a community level support, just like NCAR has rallied around uh, the community rallied behind those, those few very powerful models and put our best uh, wisdom and knowledge into those models and hydrologists need to do the same. And so, and we also need to have really integrated funding. I know we have the many models developing in parallel and then sinks a lot of taxpayers' money and they don't talk to each other. They serve different purposes. Um, and I think this landscape needs to be changed. Uh, so uh, in this regard, I'm going to highlight two models. One is the USGS um, GS flow and one is the national, the NOAA national uh, water model. As as some kind of future directions. I'm not endorsing those models personally, but I think they represent a healthy direction for the community to go. Okay, so the GS flow. The GS flow here, you can read this report, but really it couples the USGS, uh, very old land surface uh, runoff model, radial flow model, and with the USGS mod flow, which is uh, you know, very well known, basically a community model. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful model. I personally think so. I, I teach uh, use those models. And so to coupling this uh, is a really great direction to go. And so right now, USGS is uh, building this so-called national hydrologic model. National, uh, it's, it's built on the watershed level. So it gives you the details, the local details. And so but then it has national coverage. And has a long way to go because they're calibrating watershed by watershed with surface water, with groundwater, with irrigation, with human impact, with land use change, etc. 
And then they, they also side by side provided a national calibrated mod model database so that anyone, if they, they're going covering from uh, the Western states and expanding outward, and then the parameters are stored. So people can come to this national database and then look at uh, what's there already, what models are developed already. And so this is, uh, that is the USGS model. And then the second one I want to quickly mention is the National Weather Service, uh, the National Water Model, spearheaded by Dave Maitman, the shown here. And so the, the computation and the training, everything is housed in the National Water Center in, in Alabama. And they hold summer institutes every summer, have grad students and postdocs coming in to, uh, to learn to use the model. So what does the model do right now? Uh, it's really surface water right now. And so what this, shown, this is shown is like uh, hourly um, river. You can see the river, every storm comes and then moves down uh, on a national database for uh, hundreds of thousands of stream reaches, uh, down to stream reach level. They computed the national river width and height, uh, river bank storage. And so um, this is, can be done in the real time. I, have, I find this quite inspiring. And uh, then uh, they also went one step further to uh, provide flooding prediction. Uh, in, the, in the past, uh, the National Weather Service would provide a prediction of a river flow at one point. Okay, it's the flooding stage, and so what? We don't really know the extent of flooding. So use some simple terrain analysis called hand. They just map the elevation around each channel, one foot, two feet, three feet, and if the river rises, what is the area that's flooded? And so this really provides very, very useful information, and this is uh, actually uh, Harvey. And this is a great example. And so the, using the national weather model, uh, using national water model you know, with the flood mapping, and this model predicted that region two, including Houston, will be the one most impacted by, uh, by, the, by the flooding. And although the, the landfall is here, it's not in Houston. And so here it tells you the weather prediction alone does not give you really on the land what happens. And so by doing this, uh, by mapping this, look at this, they're right on. This is three days before Harvey landfall. They can predict Houston will be flooded big time. And uh, this is flooding area, one, almost 100%. And so this kind of information with three days of lead time can really be useful uh, for FEMA, for, for state uh, disaster response agencies. Uh, this kind of information should be done uh, on the national level, and then they are now doing that, the national web, um, the water model. And so they have made great strides stride in uh, getting the surface water right, the river and the flooding, extreme events. Uh, but the groundwater, uh, not yet. And so this is something I'm hoping to help uh, them to bring in the subsurface part, because we are not only experiencing flood, and what about the low water? What about the droughts? What about the groundwater slow input and during no, no rainfall drop years? And so that's a big part of the national weather model is working toward. Okay, so these are some just some quick highlights of uh, this Approach number one, downscaling, and but I do think that we really need to get organized better to have multi-scale from local to national uh, so that agencies, especially federal agencies, all level agencies can rely on the same kind of consistent information. And uh, the second approach I'm going to highlight is to bring hydrology into these weather models at the first place. And so this came really all came uh, motivated by this problem of this one way uh, downscaling uh, idea. So you have a climate model driving the land model as if the land is just a passive receiver it does not influence back to the atmosphere. And we have this room for many, many uh, colleagues of mine who have spent their career studying land atmosphere interaction. We know in many places what happens on the land can impact weather and it can impact uh, large scale circulation. And so uh, this is the motivation. We, we basically cut off, by using this approach, we basically cut off. So science wise, it's just not the best science way to do science. And so land cannot feed back. And in nature, 
uh, these two, of course, are always coupled. Uh, the coupling strengths are debatable and where and the, what mechanism, but we know water flows seamlessly in nature and uh, we can do better. And so this is where I'm going to, uh, to talk about a little bit uh, of the second approach to bringing hydrologic processes into the weather and climate models uh, at the first place. Okay, so uh, the idea is to extend this very, very thin crust uh, in those GCMs and Earth system models into deeper into the crust uh, to include extend that little shallow two, three meter land surface, free drainage land surface into something more real, into something that has shallow subsurface flow and, and with a deeper aquifer storage and fluxes. So that's the idea. And the, the pros, of course, and we can really capture the system level feedbacks as nature does it. So we can produce dynamically consistent uh, water forecast, and, uh, which is just better science to begin with. And so we can also use this kind of better science to make regional to global and long-term water cycle uh, predictions and because they're coupled now. And so um, we can have one, a unified framework, and we can really help uh, using this kind of forecast uh, to help the um, international and national community setting agenda, setting priorities on a very large scale. And so that is really uh, the, the, the pro part of it. But the con part is that when you build a model so comprehensive, so big, you lose the particular usefulness to a local place, right? You know, you have a uh, one model fits all idea. So we really um, have, to, have to really understand that. We're not going to do a, a nice job as the local models would do, the stakeholder driven, uh, local problem driven, but this is a framework and then you can and now use that framework to uh, drive a smaller model. And, uh, but the two major cons is that it's very expensive to actually represent in global models the land heterogeneity, the land uh, hill slope processes. And also, it is also um, demanding information on a global scale of the subsurface. We want to bring in the aquifers. Where are the aquifers? How deep do we go? So there's a lot of question marks. So I'm going to address uh, what are the ways we can do better. And so the first, uh, there is the, regretting the first count, they're expensive and not feasible to resolve land surface processes. And here we have tens of meters and here we have tens of kilometers, 1,000 times of scale difference. What do we do? And it's just simply not feasible. So um, I, I organized a synthesis team a few years back and so we really put together the hydrologists and the academic communities, some 50 people or so, uh, all levels of their career, to really talk about uh, this question. What are the real structures of land hydrology that we can represent without representing everything explicitly? So we talked and talked, and we decided that the two things <clears throat> that a land surface we really need to capture. One is the down valley drainage. Water flows downhill. Nobody's going to say no to that. And the other one is that the sunny side is going to be warmer and drier than the shady side. And nobody's going to argue with you that's not true. And so those two uh, critical structures and functions of land surface hydrology is what we hope to capture. So if we do that, we can represent a big watershed or a big model grid into something like a stadium, what I call the stadium model. So if you sit down here, it rains, you're going to get wetter. And then if you sit on the sun facing side, you're gonna get hotter. Basically using the simple stadium, we can collapse a watershed into uh, water and energy differences across the landscape. So by doing this, we can capture the fundamentals without causing a lot of computation. Uh, so this is going on right now, uh, with two lines. One is the NCAR, Wharf, High, Wharf uh, model, NOAA MP is the land model. We're putting, reorganizing the grid into watersheds. Watershed is a natural hydrologic unit. For atmosphere, Cartesian coordinates are perfect, but for the land, the land does not follow Cartesian coordinates. Watersheds are basic units. So we are remapping the land grid into watersheds, and then with each watershed, it's a state, little stadium. And so WARF will have this capability very soon. And on the 
parallel line is the NCAR CLM, the land model, and we're doing the same thing. And my grad student and my uh, former postdoc, uh, we were uh, working together to um, improve those two models to include the land surface processes. However, that is only scratching the surface. We capture the topography because it's something we have data. We can observe, we can immediately capture the topography, induce uh, differences in aspects and in down valley drainage. And But what about the deeper aquifers? Here, we need the subsurface information. Here, we need to get into geology, hydrogeology. And so this is our second uh, challenge, is that we need to put together the subsurface data. We don't have a global scale data. So I led another synthesis team, starting with the USGS Paul Synthesis Center, on uh, what can we do? Um, you know, we've been mapping uh, geology of the world for 300 years, for God's sake. And all the data is scattered everywhere. There are good feeling cross sections, boreholes. Nobody ever bothered to put them together. And so um, even with the USGS, and I was very frustrated working with the USGS colleagues, how they have been mapping the aquifers of the country uh, since the 80s. This is the USGS Rafa project. They have beautiful cross-sections for holes. All the major aquifers are characterized, but they're not in one place. And we cannot find them in digital formats. I talked to so many people and I'm frustrated for five years. I'm not getting this data together. And so they have, uh, I'm going to show three examples. And here is the, all the coastal plain aquifers are beautifully characterized. And uh, Mississippi embayment, the subsurface geology, aquifers, aqu uh, con confining layers, beautifully mapped, three-dimensional. And then there here is Denver Basin, mapped. Uh, here is uh, Central Valley, mapped. And so we have all this information, we need to put them together as a national uh, database. So what, I mean, the, in, over the world, I was just talking to uh, Stefan Broda, who is leading this UNESCO effort to putting world groundwater resources on one place, in one place, uh, where groundwater is, how deep it is, how much water do we have, how are they going to uh, be impacted by future climate, by, by intensive uh, with, withdrawals for irrigation. And so these all are data existing. We just need to put them together. So the synthesis team said, we're going to build a digital crust. And so we have uh, Google Earth, right? But we can go down there, go sh show on Google Earth, what are the layers when I mean, you dive down, not just zoom in, but dive down. What are the three dimensional subsurface? That's, most, that's where our water is. So we got some funding, sorry, but, but I wanted to, uh, went too fast. We got some funding, but this is something so big and really needs international, needs national level coordination. We need to get USGS motivated, uh, US, um, USDA and the soil data, everything put together to give us the three dimensional. Uh, Australia has the national uh, hydrologic fabric they match it completely for the whole nation. The Canadians do it right now, doing 3D Canada. And why can't we do a 3D US? And we have the resources, we have the data, we just have to need to have the will to put it together so that we can support uh, models of global scale and continental scale to have the real hydrology brought in. And the hydro hydrologic computations is, is trivial compared to atmospheric uh, integration computation. But yet by something like this, we can so much empower those climate and weather prediction models to have some real hydrology. So their predictions of water resource impacts can be uh, really more meaningful to the land. So to summarize, the key point uh, is that climate models are not designed for water prediction. And so what we can do is to use climate model output to drive offline fine grain, fine grid hydrologic models to get hydrologic reality. Uh, but then the problem is that uh, we have too many models. We need to really get our landscape organized. Second approach is to bring hydrology directly into climate models. This is something my group, my, my, many of my colleagues do uh, to it's just better science, but we have data and computation uh, challenges. And so going forward, I think uh, for, the, for the approach number one, we need to continue to do this because it has tremendous value to the local stakeholders. Uh, but we need to really invest in 
uh, in the community modeling system and get organized. Like the climate community, we need to get organized. We have a quasi, and the, 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 the climate community have NCAR, we have quasi, but the budget is not comparable, not even close, not even a drop in the bucket in comparison. But water is so essential for everybody, and it's not just for humans, but for ecosystems, for the carbon cycle. And we really need to get our landscape organized. And so uh, the integrated community modeling systems, there are some examples here, GS flow and national water model and work hydro, I won't have time to talk about, which is the coupling framework of weather prediction with the land hydrology. Uh, those are the, really the directions we need to invest. We need to really put them on the table and see how we can, as a community can help, can focus our effort on a few uh, better quality models. And so for two, for approach two, bringing hydrology into climate models, the biggest challenge is we need to integrate the support data. We have not done so, and the hydrologists operate on watershed scales. We just have not zoomed out and really think the large picture. I produce a map like this, you know, I cannot, we, we don't have an exciting hydrological flow map of the world. How are the rivers waning, waxing? How are the groundwater waning, waxing? We don't have a vision of that at all. And so uh, digital class, I think it's really an important uh, direction to go. And, uh, and, and to do all this, we really need to build a very, very big uh, partnership uh, with, with Google, for example, and they would love to do something like this. And if we have a, a shared vision and we can pursue this vision with integrated multi-agency funding, so we can have really an organized, seamless, and a consistent and a meaningful forecast framework to translate weather, the vertical water to the 3D, uh, from rivers to soil, to groundwater, to ecosystem, to crops, to, uh, to our forestry. Uh, so that's all I have. Okay, wonderful. Thank you so very much. And I see all kinds of uh, stuff going up. I believe I had David and then some uh, Ru Ruby. Rudy and uh, Chewy. We'll go with those I three hope and then I'll add time. One. Thank you, David. Thank you, co-chair. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, very informative uh, discussion, presentation. Uh, as I represent the uh, Ocean Studies Board, I'm very pleased to see twice the word ocean, and that is the storage of everything that comes from the land. I, uh, I, yeah, very I apologize. Um, no, 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 that's just a yeah. comment. No, no, my question is coming. My question is coming. <laughs> We are talking about land this meeting, but I firmly believe that ocean, uh, ocean drives the big, you know, when you talk about the okay. forecast. Yeah. Fine. Okay. I'll apologize more later. <laughs> on the downscaling of from the climate model to the continental scale or the regional scale that you sort of have on the screen here, uh, what utilization do you make uh, or how do you use the soil moisture data that's now been coming from satellites for the last decade? Uh, do you use the data at all? The, you mean the SMAP? Um, Whether it's SMA or SMOTH. Yeah, yeah. The Europeans or the U.S. and there'll be others. So thank you. Yeah. Uh, yes, and you know, we need data, uh, and data, uh, no matter how flawed, teaches us something real, right? Uh, no question about that. But with the soil moisture uh, satellite remote sensing, uh, it's difficult because so we can only see soil skin deep, and so and, and also in between there are clouds, there are trees. And not all soil is exposed to the satellite. So there is some limitation there. But where it is exposed, and the, definitely that should be brought into a comprehensive frame. The comprehensive framework is not just modeling framework, but also benchmarking validation framework that have data comparable to the scale of the model. Well, I'll interpret that that you don't use the data yet. I, Is that I correct? No, I, I, I'm not talking about data? my research here. In well, my research, I do, yes. Oh, you do? Yes, yes. I mean, I use GRACE, I use rivers, I use in situ, I use every observation I can get my hand on. Uh, but I'm talking about, um, you know, a forward vision for the community as a whole, what we should invest. Yes, absolutely. Answer to your question, yes, we have to. 
I'm on the NASA Earth Science Advisory Committee. I'm fully aware of the uh, the, the tremendous uh, value of what we do, especially in places we cannot go there on the ground to measure the streams, to measure the soil moisture. Uh, in Congo Basin, it's a big water bathtub. Uh, we have no data, and remote sensing is the only way for us to get something. Thank you for the question. Okay, Ruby is next. Hey Ying, it's always wonderful to hear, hear your talk. So thank you very much for the for the review. So um, I mean, just for the sake of uh, making this point, but I know that you, of course, really aware of this, and and your own great work is has emphasized a lot on vegetation. So I want want to say that uh, part of the cons of the first approach is that when people do hydrologic modeling, we like to kind of like focus on the specific things, right? So if we want, want to do the hydrology well, then we put all the focus on the groundwater, the, uh, the lateral flow and all of these different things, but then we forget about the vegetation. As we know how important the, the plant response is, the stomatal response to CO2 and things like that, it's really important for the ET. Uh, which therefore is really important for the runoff and stream flow, right? So Absolutely. Chris, Chris Miller has a really great paper about that. So just want to say that, I mean, it's important, uh, even when we are talking about like doing a community hydrologic model, we need to put, a, put some focus on the vegetation and the interaction with the hydrology as well. Absolutely. And so the synthesis project, and you were involved early on, I was really focusing on the hydrology, on, on the vegetation. So the motivation was the vegetation. Vegetation uh, transpires back uh, two thirds of the rain on land, and that's a huge water cycle pipe. We call we call vegetation the plumbers of the earth system. They are the main plumbers, and they tap deep. They pull deep water into the atmosphere, and so this is a huge player, not just water cycle, but as you said, the carbon cycle, and that is the deep. Uh, role, fundamental role the vegetation plays. And so um, in, in regulating the climate, uh, you know, it's particularly long-term scale. And so here, I, I'm, my personal research is vegetation in regulating carbon cycle, uh, going back 400 million years when land vegetation first evolved. And so it's big, I mean, going back more, you really start to see vegetation with or without vegetation, the world was a very, very different place. And there's no question about that. I'm glad you brought that out. But for, the, for, this, uh, for this conference, for this meeting, it's really uh, water for human at this point. And so I didn't want to uh, overemphasize this. Yes, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you so much. This is very educational for me. Um, learned a lot from your talk. So I have a question. Maybe I sound naive because maybe out of ignorance, but I'm trying to understand this multi-skill nature of a communication. So water cycling itself is kind of on different time scales. So in the way, there's a precipitation process itself happens on the very short time scale but then at the same time accumulation and so on. So on the decision-making process, which is the focus of the section, it's more on a few weeks to say maybe a seasonal scale. So you speak to a lot of a climate scale. So I'm trying to get a, a sense on the intermediate scale where the lot of decision-making happens and what kind of a need from the hydrology side, which relate to my question to the first speaker, is what kind of product going forward to be the most useful in terms of a sub-seasonal prediction, both on the atmosphere side, because the atmosphere side now, we're moving toward Earth system prediction model that we know land surface is a part of a predictability source, like soil moisture. But then at the same time, I'm a little less in terms of knowledge of what's needed need in the hydrology side on that time scale. If you can comment yeah, on. Yeah, yeah, and, and I apologize for uh, going on the longer time scales because there's an inherent bias on the time scales here. Uh, hydrologists working with water that has memory, has longer memory, as you said. It's not just a sub-seasonal. And yes, the sub-seasonal, the event scale, uh, precipitation forecast is hugely, hugely important in disasters, in floods in flooding, in landslides. I think Gwen will be speaking of atmospheric rivers, and these are directly useful. They don't need hydrological models, really, and hurricanes, they don't 
need an intermediate hydrologic model uh, to inform the decision making and the disaster response process. And I think uh, that is a direct translation from the subseasonal to, se to subseasonal for particularly subseasonal event skill forecast hydrology. Uh, but for, for, for the seasonal flow, and uh, as, as Andy's graph showed, you have atmosphere on days, and you have the, uh, the land surface weeks and months, and then the ocean and ice probably, ice when local, I mean, the, the snow packs will be really the seasonal scale, sub-seasonal scale. And so there is this scale, sort of a window, and the land is somewhere in between. And so uh, somewhere in between, I'm very biased to think of seasonal, to interannual, to decadal scales. And as a geologist, I'm biased to think about geologic time scale, glacial, interglacial. Yes, let's scale back. This meeting is about the seasonal to subseasonal. So going back to the subseasonal, the disaster relief, the atmospheric rivers, the hurricanes, and these have made huge advances in, in, uh, in you know, uh, providing actionable information on the ground. Uh, there's no question about that. But for the seasonal scale, I think the translation through the land filter is really important. The land filter filters out uh, some of the small fluctuations, but really retain the longer time uh, signals, particularly the seasonal cycle. And that the plants are regulated. They have their uh, evolution adaptation to the seasonal scale as well. And so the hydrologic cycle is very much, has a very, very strong pulse at the seasonal scale, especially river flow that uses shallow groundwater and the larger rivers that actually taps deeper groundwater. And so this is where hydrologic models uh, really going forward and need to nail down. How can we translate the shorter, more episodic atmospheric events into more uh, predictable, you know, filtered sort of response of the river basins and the catchment. And I think that's where we really uh, need to get on the same page. And I think we, uh, we need to, we have many, many models can, we can, can produce this, but it'd be really nice to clean up the clutter a little bit and to put our community wisdom into a field following the climate and weather communities model. I hope that answered your question. Great, thank you. Perhaps uh, just a quick uh, question so we can talk during the break. Is that in terms of coupling of the system, that's multi-scale. So at what scale do you think the most important process should be taken into account right now? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, uh, a scholar's question. And, and uh, Ruby has thought about this so much. And Ruby has, I like to quote Ruby. Ruby used to say, what is your game-changing scale? You know, so game changing scale in the atmosphere, she's been talking about the clouds resolving, convection resolving, right? At a kilometer, one kilometer scale. What is the land? What's that fundamental scale on land? To me, it's hill slopes. We know that it's the steepest slope. On land, really, the basic force is gravity, not that, not that complicated. And the gravity says water flow downhill, and then the gradient is the steepest from a ridge to a valley. When you zoom out, the gradient is not so steep anymore. And it's really a break of scale in land. It's the from ridge to valley. And so that's why the earlier graph I showed capture that ridge to valley difference, capture that sunny side and shady side difference. We capture a lot. So that is a scale we need to capture, but we don't have to do it explicitly. We can build a stadium uh, to simplify and to get the structure and function without explicit resolving every single slope. That, that, thank you, that's great. Um, we do have a bunch more cards up. Um, I don't, don't panic people, we're going past our time, but we will have time for a break. We're not scheduled to starting until 11.15, so we'll do another five minutes or so um, of questions with Ying, and then we'll take our, go ahead and take our break. You're not done, you're still working. Ying, you're still on. So um, I'm gonna, I wanna um, really, Let's, uh, if you could try to have short answers, we're going to, uh, I think we'll do about I'm five more minutes. I'm going to have a yes or no answers from Yes, now. yes or no answers from you. Exactly. Okay. So next I have, I have Allison and then I have Jonathan uh, Overpeck. So we'll go there and see where we are on time. So short is appreciated. Uh, now I have to reformulate my question as a yes or no answer. Um, so I, I really, I appreciate your uh, point about trying to do these two different approaches and this focus on advancing for the coupled models. And I think that's a really 
exciting direction to go, and I know there's a lot of work that's been going into that. And in terms of your information about what you think data is needed in terms of how you talked about this um, global project, in terms of explaining the crust butter that could be used in coupled models, um, you didn't, Dave just asked you about soil moisture, but I guess one question I have is you're talking about hill slope and drainage, but then what about all the soil and soil moisture column? And so is there data that you think you could put into that network that would also improve our predictability for soil moisture that would be really useful at this S to S scale? Yeah, and, and the soil moisture uh, is, is measured uh, mostly in the, traditionally at the point scale, right? You have a probe going down and then you measure the volum volumetric water content. That goes deeper, but it's a point. It's very difficult to compare with a model grid, which is so big and it's so heterogeneous. And the soil is notoriously heterogeneous. From one meter away, you have very different soil. And so that is an inherent difficulty in comparing uh, but but we need to bring it in, and then there's a lot of research, you know, and you yourself know so well, uh, scaling this point observation to grid level observations. So we can make meaningful comparisons. And uh, secondly, we have the area. The, there's the um, what's that? Uh, the neutron, the Cosmo, uh, the Cosmo network, uh, as well as satellite observations, and they gave us different scales, and uh, you know, from point to uh, area with the cosmos and uh, with remote sensing large uh, footprint of satellite pixels. And so uh, this, all this information needs to be brought in. Uh, there's no question about that. And the models, um, and, you know, can only be as good as the as data uh, that, that it's compared against. Uh, absolutely. And so I don't have solutions and I don't really, uh, I haven't thought too much about it, but I know uh, this is active research area, and we've been doing this for 20, 30 years. We still haven't solved the problem. We don't have a very clean theoretical upscaling, downscaling framework for something so heterogeneous. And we think soil moisture is heterogeneous, right? But you look at the soil microbial processes, it's even more hopeless. Uh, so, and so what do we do? We have an inherent problem as earth scientists. Uh, that the processes occur in such a huge range of scales, and how do we design our models that capture the fundamentals and without killing ourselves in trying to capture every detail? And so that is, in, in a way, an art. And so this is uh, where community level synthesis are critically important. We need to put it. So I led the two synthesis projects, which is really not one person can solve this problem, but we can put everybody together in the room. What we know, what we don't know, what's the best way to do it, given how hopeless the situation is. I, I was supposed to give you a yes or no answer. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right, I think we're only going to have time for one more question. Um, so I'm going to let uh, Jonathan Overpeck have the last one before break, but uh, there was an online question inquiring about uh, whether you and or maybe anybody else in the room can point to um, uh, the viewers about some of the published work on the national water model and whether that is in peer-reviewed journals. So rather than take time now, I think if we if people know of where uh, we, we might uh, be able to direct people, that would be really useful. Uh, with that, Jonathan, would you please take the last yes or no question, and then we will be on break, and we will come back and start exactly at 11.15, exactly. So the good news is I don't think I need a yes or no. I just want to pile on to your comment about uh, not knowing what our groundwater resources are. A paper came out this week uh, in uh, Environmental Research Letters, uh, Ferguson et al., and in that letter, what they, uh, in that um, piece, they highlighted that there's far less fresh groundwater in our aquifers across this country than we believe. Mm -hmm. And that we are contaminating some of them uh, with the water, you know, for producing um, gas, natural gas and also getting rid of the produced water from oil and gas exploration. Um, and so I just think uh, it's really critical as a climate scientist, seeing us get more drought, more severe drought, more dry days in the Southwest, seeing rivers in particular, river flows starting to go down precipitously due to climate change, that we really need to understand what our buffers are. So that is something that uh, when I talk to policymakers, uh, people, they just like to say, you know, don't worry about the climate. We've got lots of groundwater. That's the that's the Arizona message. It's totally wrong, it's and it's totally going to be a wrong. really it's big totally problem wrong. in the Southwest and on the High Plains, two of our most critical regions in this country. But Absolutely. this paper says it's a problem everywhere in the Absolutely. United States. Absolutely, and not just in the U.S. 
and in the Middle East and in Africa. Monsanto is going into North Africa, knowing there's groundwater. They are going to, they're buying up all the farmers land to have, you know, industrial sites groundwater pumping, like the high plains, like how we depleted our Ogallala aquifer. And we've got to do something to draw more attention to this and get an idea of what our resources really are so we can use them wisely. Yes, yes. So we really need to make this translation of climate, climate trend into groundwater trend. This is what UNESCO is right, doing right now. And uh, I'm helping them to put together data uh, to look at the long-term trends and to make projections on aquifers. That's our biggest terrestrial water source, 97% of our fresh water is in groundwater. Excellent. The buffer is only limited. The call to arms before coffee. Unless you Thank live you in Thank you very Michigan. much. 11.15 back here, everybody. Thank you, Kathy, and that really was a quite effective term. If I go over too long, you can use that same, same thing next. Well, uh, as both for coming in, I want to say uh, good morning. Um, I'm Grant Davis. I'm the general manager of Sonoma Water based in California. And right out of the gate, I'm going to admit my California bias. You just have to do that. It's sprinkled throughout this presentation. In fact, when I got the call from the academy, I was down in San Diego with Janine, and they said, you have to be here on the 29th and 30th if you're going to uh, come in and get your uh, nomination approved for best general manager in a supporting role. So I thought we'd be up in Hollywood, and I was finding I got to get on a plane and come out to uh, to D.C. So that California bias, it's real, it's Western, and we tend to think of things about what California needs and hell be damned on the rest of the, the nation. But in all seriousness, uh, I am really delighted to be here. I can tell you that I wish I had gone to Rutgers and been in, in Ling's class and you look at what she's putting out, uh, that would have been a real benefit early on in my career. And I want to thank the, uh, the Academy and the joint session here with both of you coming together. To, I want to encourage you to do this because, uh, as you can see, we have to admit that we have a long way to go. But water managers, I, I'm representing today the point of view of the end user, that forecast information uh, situation where we take what you produce and, and make real-time decisions on that. So as a result of that, um, I want to share today some of the lessons learned, what the current state of affairs are, and where we may go uh, years, years from now. And I, I love Andrew's uh, start, which would talk about the 10-year vision, uh, looking out with forecasting and hope that S2S, uh, the subseasonal seasonal forecast, could actually be the equivalent of what our weather forecasts are at some point currently today. So a 10-year vision, I, I subscribe to that. I'd like to see it even earlier, and we're going to need to invest in the type of large-scale data, the type of uh, science that you're doing, the R&D, uh, to get to where we need to. And I'm, I'm very hopeful because, if you think about it, uh, the, the, we're, we're skillful with the five-day forecasts right now, and they're actually to a point where the three-day forecast was 15 years ago. That's the type of evolution that we've, we've come about by a concerted effort. We need to do more of that so we can get the Andrews 10-year effort and hopefully be at around the 10-day, possibly to a two-week uh, time frame. But the fact of the matter right now, the two-week skill set is not developed enough for water managers like us to actually make informed decisions to integrate it into our water management plan. So that's really the challenge. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what we're doing with our uh, colleagues to uh, advance that and then what water managers probably throughout the nation could benefit from with continued effort. So with that, I, I would like to uh, indicate just a, 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 a way to show where we're coming from. If you look at this particular map, it's not showing up really well. And I, I was afraid of that when we put it in there, but I wanted to make sure you saw the Golden Gate Bridge. Most people know where that is. And we serve water to the three counties north of the Golden Gate Bridge. So that white area there is the Russian River watershed out in California, and that's our primary source of drinking water. 
So Elaine mentioned about the importance of watersheds. I completely agree that watersheds are in fact the basis by which we should be looking at models and downscaling model and being able to inform our decision making process. So uh, to orient you further, uh, if you look at uh, up north about 100 miles from the Golden Gate Bridge is our Lake Mendocino. It's our smaller reservoir that I'm going to talk about a lot today. That's also about 50 miles inland from the coast. And it's that reservoir that we've been doing some pioneering work with some cutting edge scientists with many of you in the room. And I'd like to focus on that. Um, there's the California bias again. And before I get there, I wanna just give a little more background about Sonoma water, because if you come all the way out here, you wanna talk about what else you do. We're wholesalers to 600,000 customers in those three counties to the north I mentioned, Mendocino, Sonoma, and Marin County. But we also have charge for flood control operations, which is rather unique. And we actually manage a series of over 75 miles of engineered and natural channels for flood protection purposes, along with a series of large detention basins that provide flood capacity throughout Sonoma County. In addition to that, we have management responsibilities for eight different zones and districts for sanitation in Sonoma County. And that means we're producing recycled water and water wastewater services throughout the region. So we're already a very integrated operation. The other uh, thing I should mention about us before going into detail is that the Russian River system where we're deriving our water supply from is not connected to the Bay Delta system in California. And that has some strategic advantages. Basically, when we're innovating out there doing good work uh, and we find something that we can replicate, we do that fine. Uh, the reverse is also true. If we really screw things up, we're not gonna take down the Bay Delta system. It's isolated to the Russian River. And I have a board of directors that's also unique because the five of them are not just the, war, the Sonoma Water Board, they're also Board of Supervisors members, which means they care about transportation and healthcare and energy in a much more integrated fashion. So when you look at Sonoma Water, those integrated components are what we're managing for, and it makes us a little bit more willing to reach out to the academic community and build those partnerships and start pioneering that R&D work that we're gonna talk about today. So California bias, again, if you look at this, what do you see? Big red circle in our, in our area, but that is in fact what we're responsible for. And then you look and you're drawn to the black and the blue and the, the, the dark greens, and that's, that's California. We have the most variability in terms of precipitation in the US, and that creates significant challenges. That variability is something that we have to manage to, and it makes our job very challenging. Uh, you look at the East Coast, it's generally plentiful with water. And in most cases, as Robbie said, you have plenty of water. Sometimes it's too much. Uh, in our case, it's more often than not too much and too little. The slide you see here is our biggest challenge. Our extreme form of weather was mentioned earlier. They're atmospheric rivers. These are essentially, just like they sound, rivers in the sky. And one of them's pictured here. It's a February 16, 2017, uh, atmospheric rivers striking the north coast and up into Oregon. And these atmospheric rivers are our form of uh, extreme weather that cause over 80% of the flooding in, in our region. Uh, we must do a better job of understanding this phenomenon. These long narrow bands of water vapor, they're actually carrying upwards of 27 times the water vapor and the water at the mouth of the Mississippi River. The staggering amount of water coming in to hit and we need to know when they're coming, we need to know if they're gonna be above or below our dams, and we need to make corrective action. And the problem right now is we've got a lot of work to do to be able to integrate where atmospheric river research is going into our water supply planning. This slide by uh, Mike Dettinger uh, out of USGS and Dan Cahan out of UC Santa, Santa, uh, San Diego is really uh, a story in that variability I was talking about. Uh, this is the Russian River going way back to 1900. The top line is actual water year precipitation throughout the years. And that red line is the top 10% of precipitation days. Uh, the green is merely background noise, it's all the rest. So you'll see that the top 10 precipitation days correlate very nicely along that line of, of atmospheric rivers. They're associated with, with water precipitation and a 10% exceedance. So this is something that's also true primarily. I've seen a very similar uh, situation for the entire state of California. The atmospheric rivers are causational for this type of extreme weather. 
Now, why Sonoma County? Uh, I, I've talked to some of you earlier this morning. Um, we've gone through, as, you, as many may know, the drought on record back uh, in 2013, 14, 15, right into early 16. And that was a significant uh, set of years. And I'll, I'll tell you more a little bit about that. But in terms of drought, S2S would be extremely helpful. If you're looking at what the definition is earlier, said it was about a three week to a year time frame. Uh, if we knew and we had better measurements and better warning uh, with drought conditions, imagine what water managers would do. They'd be holding back water and they'd be metering that out very judiciously. If they knew they weren't gonna get any more, uh, they would be much more inclined to, to take the risk because drought conditions, uh, I can assure you at Lake Mendocino at the end of 2015, I was managing a mud puddle. Uh, in fact, Governor Brown's first drought task force was at, uh, in, in Mendocino County at the top of Lake Mendocino staring into a reservoir that the ag community and fish were relying upon, and we were in, in, in serious shape. So I wanna tell that story a bit, but before I do, uh, you've also heard the news about wildfires, very, very serious and large catastrophic wildfires out west. And in California, we have just been hammered. So it just so happens two years ago uh, in 2017, Sonoma County was the uh, un unfortunate bearer of the largest and most destructive wildfire in California history. We lost uh, over 40 uh, lives in that process, 5,000 plus structures, mainly residents and businesses burned to the ground. And I cannot believe, but uh, a year later, uh, the county of Butte ended up with uh, that noble distinction. They lost 7,000 structures, primarily residences. They've lost over 80 humans and the list is growing with those that have been missing. It's, it's a tragedy. And there is not a roadmap for resiliency and recovery. And we have to develop one. We have to learn from each of these incidents. The story here about wildfire is such that it's an obvious threat to your water supply facilities. We've had the SFPUC and others uh, throughout San Diego. We've got lessons learned, but what we are worrying about right now is a series of wildfires followed by atmospheric rivers that are going to dump the type of volume of water I talked about into the exact same area. And the mudslides and the debris removal, the toxicity into your aquatic ecosystems are not good. So um, in Sonoma's case, uh, we hit, we had fires October, 2017. Uh, we, 2018 was a year that worked out pretty well. The atmospheric rivers came, but they were spread out and they didn't, uh, the, the soil was not entirely saturated when they came through. That came up earlier today. Uh, so we made it through without the type of debris and mudslides. But in Southern California, they had fires in Santa Barbara and the Venturia area. And so Montecito, even though it was predicted that you had atmospheric rivers on the way, you still saw significant mudslides and over 20 human, humans lost their lives and millions of dollars in damages. This have huge implications. We're talking about billions of dollars here just out west and why California and the western region has to get a handle on this. So again, the message here is that atmospheric rivers are, are the cause. When they come behind fires, you have serious results that you have to be aware of. And then lastly, the flooding. And I would say that uh, what's not known is that the Russian River actually has the highest incidence of flood reoccurrence west of the Mississippi River. So you can kind of see why uh, California is a good case study for how to handle these extremes. And when you know what the cause is, we have an urgent need to understand that phenomena and take corrective action. So getting back to the Russian River, the red circles right here, you've got Lake, Lake Mendocino, Lake Sonoma, Lake Sonoma, I'll briefly say, is a multi-year reservoir built in 1983, uh, has carryover storage. It's got 245,000 acre feet. We're pretty good. Uh, that reservoir is one of the la latest ones built. Multi-year storage, we did pretty well. We can manage that, particularly as our demands have actually gone down through the years, through the drought. Uh, the per capita water use trend's gone down, and we've actually taken action to reduce our call on the Russian River. But... Not so on Lake Mendocino. Again, 100 miles north of the Golden Gate Bridge, smaller reservoir, about 111,000 acre feet. Uh, that's what we co-manage with the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. They have it for flood control purposes, and we have it for water supply purposes. So when Ravi said earlier that water is a situation where you never have enough or you have too much, and it all depends on when you get it there, you need it when you need it. What I like to tell is a story about the, the, the Corps and the folks that are responsible for flood control. What's their optimum situation with a reservoir like ours? Completely empty. For flood control, you can't get any better than that, right? 
Me, I'm on the other side of that. I want that thing full as can possibly be because I got to make it through the, the, the summer months and I want to see full reservoirs. That dynamic tension is what we're dealing with. Those are what water managers are faced with. When you think about your science, you look at linking climate and hydrology. And I really love what Ying was, was talking about is narrowing those disciplines, bringing them together and having longer range forecasts because that's going to be our story. So in this case, uh, I forgot to mention, but it's listed here, one of the main drivers on the Russian River is that we have three uh, listed species of fish. We have coho salmon, steelhead, and chinook. And those fish and the endangered species list drive a lot of our work because on the Russian River, we use those two main tributaries, the uh, Dry Creek and the Russian River, as our natural pipeline. We take care of our watershed, and our premise is that we need to recover the fish species, make the habitat improvements, and if you do that, you'll securitize your water supply. That's a premise that Sonoma Water is living up to every day. And uh, as I go into this next slide, I wanna give credit. Scientists are better than, than water managers at doing this. But um, Chris Delaney is one of my Cracker Jack engineers who helped me with this presentation. He's done some pioneer modeling work. And it made me think when Ling was talking about 60 different hydrologic models in one of the regions of the US, what is one of the better, better jobs you could have right now for job security? Water modeling in the hydraulic region, right? Tell me about it. How many? We don't get our act together. What happens is you build your own models and you jealously guard those and you want to make sure that they work. But she did point out a couple promising things I just want to ad lib here, and that is the national water model and the USGS flow. When you look at those two examples on a national scale. What you look at with partnering with agencies like us is that we can help refine those and you build those up on a watershed scale or multiple watershed scales and you're able to make those more refined uh, bits of models available to regions that can benefit both on the land and water side. So this is a story of Lake Mendocino and this is the guide curve. And I have to, to laugh because this is no, there's no curve here, that's a misnomer. Would you, anyone see a curve there? That's literally our guide curve. This is the operational control manual and you are looking at something on the left which says in October, you can be up around 111,000 acre feet. But come November one, you need to be down at the, the lower level of around 68,000 acre feet. And the reason you do that is because of the flood control needs, the danger of floods, ARs coming in, hitting that reservoir, you need to have a very conservative straight line. So literally this was built uh, and designed in 1959. And I like to say, if you are dealing with a heart problem, you would not want your surgeon to be using 1959 technology, would you? I wouldn't feel too comfortable about that. We've made a lot of progress in the way. So. Then uh, come around March, you can begin up the trend line and get by, by May, you can get back up to the 111,000 acre feet because you can expand the supply pool because the threat of large rain events is now gone. This is gonna take a little talking, but it's important. This is the main theme I wanna talk about of how water managers have to deal in the area of extremes. If you look at the solid lines on here, the solid green line is the actual storage in Lake Mendocino in year 2012. And I'm talking about two year types here is to make my point. The blue solid line is the year 2013 and actual storage in Lake Mendocino. And before you get too far into that, below the dashed lines are actually the year in precipitation. The green is 2012. And what you'll see is that around mid-January, you start to see atmospheric rivers come in and really hit us in March. And you see those spikes in 2012 go up right on the edge of the rule curve on the gray, gray there, and we were able to hang on to that water all the way through the summer and start the year in pretty good shape. Jump forward to year 20, 2013, and you see that, that virtually the same amount of water was, was brought into our watershed and delivered in the atmosphere, but it's the timing and the sequence that we have to manage for. And what happened here is it happened in, in December. All the action was in December, and then late December, early Christmas present, we ended up with an atmospheric river that literally spiked us up into the flood control pool there. And you see what happened right after that. What happened after that is we had the core looking at these two operations. They are above the flood control line that I spoke of, and they had to actually release all that water almost instantaneously. And I'm not criticizing them directly because you have to use the control manual. Those are the rules. They're conservative for a reason because you don't want to take on extra flood liability. But my goodness, we, at that point, what's really tragic is that's the very beginning of the drought, a four-year drought right after this. 
We didn't see a drop of water barely for the rest of the four-year period. That's what I'm talking about. It had real-life implications. I'm managing a mud, mud pool up in Mendocino, not good. Some of the prime wine grape growing region in the country with fish that are endangered, and I'm starting to really worry. So that's the sense of urgency that Sonoma Water is bringing. So what do we do? We said, how can we begin to get more flexibility on that 37,000 acre feet that was released? That is about 80% of the average water supply that I sell in a year. Can you imagine that? You can see that we had to do something. So here was our response. We took a look at the two week forecast from the hydrologic ensemble put out by the weather service. And we said, that's where you begin. You got to look at that two week period and you can start to see that that's the, the starting edge of where S2S is going to be. So we're interested in seeing the zero, the two week forecast be as strong as possible. And quite frankly, it's better in the one week. So that two week is, is not there yet. And we got to get there. I know I'm going to get a question from you, Simon, because you asked about this. Um, we said, we need to come up with a process using the, the weather service models and the ensembles. We need to build an interdisciplinary team that is going to demonstrate a way that we can come up with improved water supply reliability, uh, not make the flood, flood worse, in fact, not diminish the flood control capacity. I think we can actually improve upon it. And we need improved environmental outcomes. That was our challenge. And we started back in 2014, the Forecast Informed Reservoir Operations or FIRO Committee. And the, many members of that are here. You can see we put together an interdisciplinary team of collaborators, many that are here that will be uh, some talking later on. You've got the Bureau of Reclamation, the Army Corps of Engineers, USGS, more importantly, Department of Water Resources for our purposes because they are bringing in the type of state support that's required for this. And then our local partners. In particular, you have the University of San Diego, Scripps Institution of Oceanography, and now the CW3E that's located there putting out this incredible atmospheric river research because that is where we've got to hone our resources. Using what they had there, um, we put together co-chairs. My chief engineer, Jay Jaspers, deserves a lot of credit because he's able to blending those two hydrologic and climate science disciplines that Ling was talking about. He has unique capabilities of doing that. He teamed up with the Dr. Marty Ralph from uh, UC San Diego Scripps and the rest of the members are here. Crystalini obviously should be on this, uh, this list and, and somehow got left off, but look at that. Uh, this is what it takes to solve complex issues today in water management, in a disciplinary team. And I heard that theme earlier, I subscribe to that. The team put out a preliminary viability assessment uh, back in 2017, uh, which concluded that in fact, forecast informed reservoir operations could be of value to water management in Lake Mendocino. In addition, the, uh, the uh, pilot demonstration indicated that uh, major uh, deviation requests should be put forward to the Corps of Engineers. And I'm, I'm pleased to say that we've made some progress there. I'll tell you about in just a minute. The preliminary viability also had uh, noticed that longer lead times from S2S forecasts would enhance and benefit the water supply and flood control purposes that we're dealing with. And lastly, that we need further research into meteorology, hydrology, and reservoir operations. That's a common theme. So 2019, we fortunately just this month received notice from the Army Corps of Engineers that the committee, the Furo Committee requested, which was a major deviation that was made in January of 2018. Just this month, we've received notice that we're able to manage 2019 with forecast informed reservoir operations as a control. That's progress, right? Looking at this particular area right now, you see about a 10,000 acre foot difference between the 68,400 acre foot, that's the flood pool, up to 80,000 acre feet. We're able to use forecasts now this year to demonstrate proof of concept in that reservoir. And what we're trying to do is improve water supply at the end of the year, actually not make any flood control, flood capacity worse. In fact, hopefully improve that and have water left over for fisheries and environmental considerations, like I mentioned earlier. So that's our challenge. We were given this opportunity because of great coordination, support from Congress and, and the state. We were able to get initial money so that folks are not doing this for free. That's not fair. You need to bring people in and the stuff does cost money. We happen to coordinate on a major level and this is the result. 2017, I mentioned earlier, was the wettest year on record out in California. Remember that theme about extremes and variability? four year drought broken by an atmospheric river. Not only did we have one, we had 17 
moderate to strong atmospheric rivers hit the west coast. Typically, you're looking at a year that could be anywhere from three to five of these. And with 17, it was the perfect year to use a very wet year to test our theory. So that's what we'll be doing. We were able to hindcast back, uh, looking backwards into the year, and uh, utilize this very wet year and 17 ARs to see what the response would be and see if we couldn't do a better job than the current control manual. Pretty basic, but pretty ingenious work on modeling. So bear with me here. What you'll see this December through February uh, through a major deviation is the blue line is the actual observed. This is what the core did and would do for that year with, a major, with, with uh, just regular operational criteria. The red line is what we call the hybrid, the virtual hybrid, but the, the major deviation that we're gonna operate to. And you'll see in December this year, right at the beginning there, the core starts releasing water back down to that lower level. So those lines that go across that are dotted, the blue line is what the current control manual is, and the red would be the forecast and form reservoir level, 10% more, if that makes sense. You see the core in December drops down and starts releasing to make room for what would possibly be uh, atmospheric rivers and, and high rain. But we realized the forecast did not have those in there and we were able to start banking water in that December time period. Jump forward again for those spikes and you start to see that through January and February, we're tracking. We're doing just about what the, the uh, observes was. But when you, when you look at the bottom trend here, the reason we were not able to get, uh, that we didn't have incre in, increased flooding is we're following the most flood prone area down below on this grid is Hopland, right below Lake Mendocino. It floods quite a bit, and that's the one we used to make sure we were not acerbating that problem. So the high peaks are right here, they're observed. You have the no increase in the peak flow down below for flooding. And when you then jump forward from that period, you'll see we added the months of April and May, and that's really where the action comes in. That's the, the, the spring season. And what you'll see is the old way of doing business is the core would have been taking the water that comes in and vacating that down around the May 10th timeframe. You see that drop, that the, the blue observed. Instead, with the virtual hybrid and the Thero informed, you begin to hang on to that water because the threat of atmospheric rivers diminishes into the spring. And you're looking backwards, 15 day forecast, and every day you move it out forward. It's pretty, pretty straightforward. You're looking at forecast to help inform your, your, your operational criteria. So that by the end of May, you're looking at this scenario and you store 8,000 acre feet of water in May going into the new year. And uh, that's a significant amount of water. And you wouldn't have expected this on the wettest year on record. You start to see the power of this. So I'm pleased that we were able to demonstrate this looking back with Hindcast for 2017. I'm seriously pleased that we have a major deviation request that's been approved by the Corps. And that now the final viability assessment is ready to, uh, we're working on that. It, it has components, the scientific R&D research, which includes additional hydrology and engineering. We're gonna be looking and utilizing S2S forecast to help improve our precision on that with that viability assessment. We're gonna improve the AR detection and observation and monitoring to help inform that piece of it. And then interim operations. Ultimately, we're looking at technical studies that will be decision support tools to help us in, inform how we will operate our reservoirs Obviously, what folks want to know is, can this be replicated? And I'm saying not yet. I'm saying we have to get this viability assessment done and done correctly because flooding is not, uh, not something you want to play around with. I don't want to take on and be cause, causing additional flooding. So we have to be conservative. You have to demonstrate this using the best available science, and you've got to be pretty darn sure. So this viability assessment is really important that you don't jump the gun, but ultimately it is leading to a... Up, update of the water control manual, that 1959 version that I spoke about, we need to have forecast inform that. And ideally, the science is going to help us produce a product that is not only more flexible and more accurate, but something that you don't have to keep renewing. It's very expensive to renew these water control manuals. We want to do it once and have it evolve over time. So in closing, uh, I'd like to say that I do believe that we're going to improve S2S forecasting, that, that we're on track. If we work together at the National Academy, continues to take this on like you had a couple years ago and you keep making progress and we go from the five day out to the seven day, ultimately the 10 day and maybe a year, that is gonna help water managers throughout the entire West, in fact, the entire nation. So in water supply planning, another factor to consider would be in droughts. 
Imagine if you knew a drought was coming and you had three months to prepare for that. You'd be building up your water conservation portfolios. You'd be budgeting something that would actually plan on delivering less water. So you'd be uh, putting in programs that would take that water and use it more efficiently and also would not hit your rate base because that is unfortunately what happens in droughts. Forecast informed reservoir operations as a result of all this coordination are going to be improved. I mentioned that with water supply and with flooding. Uh, conjunctive use management, it came up earlier. That's when you start integrating the groundwater models that USGS is quite good with, with the hydraulic models, the surface and groundwater modeling that's got to come together. It is coming together, but not fast enough. It's got to be done, I think, on a watershed scale. Should be integrated into a national model, not unlike the GS Flow is doing and the Water Center. And you begin to build a much more precise portfolio of how better, more informed water management can occur. And just to round that out to, to comment, because we do run a sanitation facilities, if you had S2S forecasting that was accurate, you'd be making sure that you're less prone for, for sewage spills and, and overflows um, out in the sensitive areas, particularly in the San Francisco Bay Area. And my last concluding one on the environmental side would be, imagine if you had an S2S forecast and you're being asked to make environmental releases for fish purposes, you would be more inclined to do that if you knew that water was going to be replaced in your reservoir. It's a lot harder to make that decision to make a pulse flow occur when you don't know it's a flip of the coin whether it's going to be wet or dry. So with that, that's what I wanted to, to leave you with today. And I appreciate very much the opportunity to be here. And I don't care if I don't get the Oscar, that's okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, cards are flying. So Pamela and then Ravi. Hi, uh, Pam Amshit, Northrop Grumman. I'm on the Basque. Um, so one thing that you did not mention here, maybe it doesn't, maybe uh, it, it doesn't impact you, your water, uh, your watershed as much. Um, so you talked about atmospheric rivers and predicting those, but you didn't talk about snowpack. Yeah. So can you say a few things about if you've considered that or other yeah, watersheds? Yeah, it's a great question. In fact, when you think about California, you have to be considering snowpack. The only difference is I mentioned earlier, probably should have reemphasized it. The Russian River is not a snowpack dependent system. We're fortunate for that. We have one less feature we have to worry about. But really, believe me, when Janine starts talking about and others talk about California's water system, it's snowpack driven. And atmospheric rivers can do one of two things. They can fill your reservoirs. But depending on the temperature, they can actually decrease your volume of, uh, of snow. If you think about when they come in and at what elevation, but they also can add to it. So we've got to do a better job. And that's a key feature that the, if we take this system and start replicating it, we're already looking at Prado Dam down in Orange County, which is on the Bay Delta system and has uh, connectivity, but someplace like Folsom recently doing their spillway, definitely looking at snowpack and snow melt. And that has to be factored into your modeling. Ravi and then David Titley. Grant, thank you for this talk. You do get my Oscar. Um, <laughs> if, I, if I had one, I would give it to you. Okay. Um, you really, there's kind of a, you're a poster child for how science can make society better. I wish we could get people like you up and talk to people who actually support science. Uh, there might be a role you might want to think about, <laughs> but anyway, but I have a slightly, this is wonderful. But the question though is that you're a pretty high tech, high resourced operation, it seems to me. But the rest of the country and the rest of the world is probably not there. Yeah. What are the lessons you're going to give them? Well, um, I have a follow up question on that. Okay, let me, if I can't ask that and if you follow up. Yeah, it's true. We're in Sonoma County, California. We're blessed. We also are heavily stressed. I think there's a bit of an obligation, and I've mentioned some of the reasons why we do this, because my board is already integrated. They, they understand it can't be all about water. There is flood control, there's sanitation, there's renewable energy. Uh, I didn't have time to go into this, but we made a major investment throughout my tenure, and we're now delivering our water supply carbon-free did that in 2015. That means it's all renewable that's coming into that system. That's a sustainable approach. We were, one of the, we're I think we're the only one to do it, but I believe now others will follow. So if we can be a template, if we can do things and replicate what works, we can cut down on the, the, the time it takes to be number two and number three, and you can learn, much like we have with fires. We had to learn from San Diego. We had to learn from Santa Barbara. We had to learn from other places that got decimated. Now Butte is asking us, can you help? You learn as you go, and that's what science is all about. 
I will always be uh, an advocate for this. And whether you, I, you're holding this meeting, I would encourage you to do more of it and bring in, bring in my other, the real engineers, the ones who know this in and out, bring Chris and Jay back here. My hope is that the Academy will do that or come out West, but we need your help. We are water managers, but we're not going to do a good job without the longer term forecasting and the, the seasonality that you're talking about today. Wonderful. I think we'll go ahead and get started. Um, we have a really interesting afternoon panel. Um, Terry Hogue from the Colorado School of Mines is going to run the panel for us. So I'm, with no further ado, I'm going to pass it to her and she will introduce panelists and run the afternoon session. Thank okay. you. Great. Thank you, Kathy. Um, so I'm super excited to run this panel this afternoon. Um, we're going to focus this afternoon kind of on this, much more on the water management, water use and management side. So kind of following up on grants, uh, kind of segue into this. So I think this is a great opportunity for us to really hear from the stakeholders and users what they need from us and how we can help facilitate integration of our, our science into their operations. Um, so kind of bringing us back to what this panel was about, um, it's kind of looking at this research needs, challenges and opportunities for all of us to engage. I'm going to introduce the panel. I have Tirasu Asafa from Tampa Bay Water Authority, David Rath from Bureau of Reclamation, Janine Jones from California Department of Water Resources, and Roger Powari from NOAA. So I think we're going to go in that order also for our uh, talks today. And, and again, just kind of bring us back to the goals that were listed at the beginning of um, and in our um, agenda for today. Really, the goals of the entire day today were to really nurture ongoing discussions on research, challenges, and opportunity in the seasonal to sub-seasonal forecasting arena, and look at opportunities for kind of connecting the hydrologic, atmosphere, and climate modeling communities, and how we can better inform applications and integrations in, into stakeholder decision-making tools. And then again, I think the, the big goal of this today was also to kind of think about how we can exchange and interact more between the boards and our stakeholder communities and really look for future projects to kind of move us forward. Um, so with that, I'll let the speakers go ahead and we'll start with Tara Sue. And um, I'm going to have them each, I think they're each doing 10 to 15 minutes maybe. So okay. we'll hold questions, unless there's a clarifying question, I think until the end. And then we'll have, a, I think, plenty of time, hopefully about an hour or so, for some really great in-depth discussion. I've got some questions to generate some uh, discussion if we need it. So with that, I think uh, Carly is going Good afternoon. Uh, happy to be here. Um, it's always a pleasure to see everybody in one place. Uh, good afternoon. Happy to be here. It's always good to see everybody in one place. We started today with a challenge in seasonal forecast from climate perspective. We heard where we are and where we could be going. And then the hydrology, uh, the challenge of hydrologic proje uh, projection and changing that climate information into hydrology, then put that together, that's the problem I have. Uh, so we have to make a decision on uh, real time to some seasonal in order to bring that to, for, for making a decision. So Tampa Bay Water, before I get there, I, I want to tell you that a lot of utilities in the U.S. have tremendous amount of debt for infrastructure. Most of them, they have 50%. Uh, a lot of the revenue goes to, towards the infrastructure building new supply. Um, I want to argue here that what we do in a seasonal scale is also in, uh, related to what we do in, the, in terms of infrastructure. Um, over the last decade and a half at Tampa Bay Water, I learned a thing or two how these seemingly unrelated uh, two aspects are related. I lead the planning and decision support group. Planning, planning is basically looking at the future water supply. The decision support is who is doing the modeling. Now, 
typically people don't really remember our, uh, about us as long as there is shortage or there is a bill which is coming up because of infrastructure, hey, your water bill is going up. Then people really remember what we are doing. So most of the time what we do is behind the scene. It's okay, but that's how we do. Uh, to give you a perspective, uh, Grant mentioned his bias for California. My bias is for Florida, and he's actually generous enough to give you the whole map. I'm not showing the whole map of US even. Uh, Tampa Bay water is at the uh, uh, west central uh, uh, coast. You can see we have we are wholesale water delivery for three counties and three cities. Uh, the right side, you will see that it's just uh, uh, some of our uh, infrastructure. So we have a very diversified portfolio. Uh, groundwater, the one on the left top panel you see is the groundwater, a typical well field. Uh, and then also surface water withdrawal, uh, offsite reservoir, and a desalinated seawater. We used to say we are the, the largest in America, but San Diego came back and we, now we are saying the largest in the East Coast, <laughs> which still works. So the challenge is that 20 years ago, we are actually celebrating our 20 years now. 20 years ago, everything was coming from groundwater. Because of that shift to, dif to diversify our portfolio, we actually increased our risk profile. Now we have to depend on climate forecast, hydrology to be able to supply water. So from 100% groundwater, today we are about 65 groundwater, about 30, 35% surface water, and then five to 10% desalinated seawater. Now, we have a multi-scale decision support tool, so I'm not gonna go there, and if you guys want, uh, I have a reference here that start from week to week operations and then monthly operations, seasonal to multi-decada. So we try to come up with all these hydrologic uh, models at a different time scale and make decisions. The one on the left you see is a uh, typical SCADA operation. So my group typically what it, do, it does is it forecasts the next week's demand and supply, optimize from where source we can provide and send it back to the operators who actually make that happen. The table, which is very difficult to see, but I'm gonna show you what gets in, is a seasonal allocation level decision support tools. So in the morning, we heard about some of the probabilistic forecasts which are available. How, how we get there for us is, um, as you know, most of the time what we get is a large scale indicator. So that bias correcting, downscaling, and making it to something that's useful local, that's what we have been spending our time. So typically what we do is we, we use this large scale ENZO or probabilistic uh, forecast, and then we generate some rainfall which is consistent with our area and that feeds into the stream flows. And then that will be a decision making. Every month we get together and the first thing we talk about is about climate. What's gonna be, what is the ENZO state? What do we expect for the next two, three months, and so on. And on the right side, you can see actually a, uh, a, um, a report. So this is from November 1. And this is what comes from November 1. And this is like uh, summer in Christmas time. It doesn't typically happen like this for us. But this is because we are expecting El Nino, or we are told so, so we have to use that information to come up with forecast for stream flows. So in addition to stream flows, then it has to go to other works of the agencies. If this doesn't play out, I'm gonna blame you guys because the, it comes from all those climate information. Um, the next one I want to show you is, and then we also use, there was a great question how seasonal operations is tied to infrastructure investment. This is key, I want to mention. So we have what we call a residual risk management tool. The idea is that we know 20 years from now what is the demand, we'll forecast at least as much as good as what the economy, uh, economists say. That's another, by the way, uncertainty for us. There is economic uncertainty where we forecast our demand. Sup supply is forecasted also, and then you try to meet that supply gap. 
you wouldn't be, I wouldn't be working in Tampa Bay Water if I, if I say, hey, we have to build for 99.9 .9 reliability of water. So what we do is that we select some point of reliability and then we try to match the rest, as we call it, a residual risk management or water shortage mitigation plan. Now, this tool actually looks three months ahead. This is a typical uh, flow we generate through our reservoir. And based on, this is just an example from 2007. So the green and the red are certain uh, alarm levels. If it passes actually below the red, it's called the water-like crisis. So everybody has to uh, conserve water and so on. Now, we put ourselves in a way that we want to use this nine months ahead, and we are declaring actually before this happened nine, nine months, uh, nine days ahead. So as you can imagine, we are using this tool, and if this tool doesn't get buy-in, because the people watch every day what we do, every month what we do, and we cannot just trigger the whole area is in shortage, and suddenly it's not the case. You don't want to um, uh, lose the trust from the uh, the, the consumers, but that is how we tied up a short-term uh, operations into a long-term planning. In fact, we are trying to do, we are doing research right now how we can see our risk of failures and we, we have some planning risk of failures. So when we reach that risk of failures, maybe a trigger to bring a new supply source. So there is a lot of things going on with this kind of model, but the issue is how good is our projection? So, we, so any advancement that we heard uh, in the morning will be useful for us. So another typical example, I'm giving you an example here also. Uh, last year, the operation came and they told us, you know, we want to draw down the reservoir sometime in July and we want to do these uh, operations and then tell us we will be okay by the beginning of the next water year. That's at the end of the summer whether we should be full reservoir or not. Well, academically, this is exciting for us. It's, whoa, we can crunch this number. We have probabilistic forecast. And we told them, what you see here actually is the greens are your probability of filling the reservoir by the end of the summer. And we are starting at May. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of challenge on getting this kind of information. We told them, hey, you have about 18% to get there. So you guys want to move this or not? So, and th that's the challenge. First, we have to come up with something that to give them some actionable. So the right side is, is an example of, we have these huge pumps of operations. So depending on flows condition, they want to, to know, am I going to operate 30 days, 90 days, these huge pumps, and there is a lot of cost and so on. So all these are based on what we do at the seasonal level, all the projection. So what's important for us is not to lose the trust of those people. There was a question in the morning, I'm almost done, I'm gonna give it back uh, regarding the 2014 El Nino. So I can give you an example of the 2018 La Nina. So 2017, it was perfect, we for the forecast was good, we told them we'll be in trouble, everybody was ready, we were good, but the 2018, as some of you know, was actually, at the beginning it was an El Nino, then it turns out to be a La Nina. So I was there with all my group, say, we are expecting this, after two months, they say, what is that El Nino? I said, I don't know, <laughs> ask somebody else. So those are the things, and in a way we like to use all this information, but when things may not play out, then we have to be careful on that, so that we don't lose uh, a trust from them. So it's not only me, I have a bunch of people there, actually dedicated staff who are doing all this work. So I would like to give them a shout out to all the people who are in my department. That's all. I don't. So Dave is up next from Bureau of Reclamation. Uh, so, uh, good afternoon and thanks for having me. Um, uh, this is an exciting time, I think, in this area. 
Um, and what I hope to communicate is a variety of things. Uh, but yesterday I had the opportunity to speak to a smaller assemblage of you all. And, and one of the things uh, I pitched then that I'm going to pitch now in a slightly different way, uh, but similarly, was, again, a focus on the need to bring your community or the community of research into a way that is more directly informing uh, practice uh, or operations types of activities. Um, not a new concept of the bridge from research to application, uh, but um, I think there is an opportunity in this organization as the right one to do that. Uh, that's a vague concept, so let me pitch something more specific based off of what I've heard today, um, as well as just thinking about how I wasn't helpful with that concept yesterday. And that is that uh, I think in a short term, one way to do that is simply to have another meeting uh, or workshop or conference, whatever you want to call it, uh, whereby the federal community and states uh, and locals, frankly, can, uh, can share real world decision making from policies to tools, because I think that there um, is a lack of communication and that would hopefully better set a target for research practices to inform those things. Um, I don't think it's fair for the federal community or others to simply say, we're not being informed, uh, we need to educate better. Uh, so that would be my pitch as a, as a quantitative outcome uh, from, from this meeting, um, whereby we can tell you which tools we use, where we use them, how we use them, uh, which policies go into these things, what are the constraints, and, uh, and help set the target for your future research. And to that extent, I think that's what I hope to share here um, today to a certain to, to a certain. I'm going to start at the end um, and move backwards. Um, now is an exciting time for this topic. Um, as you already heard this morning from Sonoma, um, uh, FIRO forecast informed reservoir operations or the use of subseasonal to seasonal forecasting to actually inform water management in the United States. Now is the time. Lake Mendocino is one of the first uh, in the Western United States. Um, it's something that ties together aspects of flood control, the Corps of Engineers, primary responsibility, and water supply, which is a local, uh, in this case, uh, state, local type of responsibility, uh, but reclamation at federal reservoirs, which Mendocino is not, uh, uh, not a reclamation reservoir, um, we have that same type of goal. Uh, and F2S is really the bridge uh, whereby we can work with the Corps uh, or the constraints from supply and demand in one unified way. Um, so Mendocino was talked about. I'm not going to take some of my precious time on that. Uh-oh. There we go. Uh, another good example of the time is now is Folsom. It was mentioned earlier. The Joint Federal Spillway Project at Folsom is essentially complete in terms of construction. Operations are taking place. Uh, anticipated the Water Control Manual uh, may be signed as early as January of 2019. Um, just this morning, I got a copy of the October 2018 uh, preview of that document. Um, and uh, this is probably the largest forecast informed proposed operations in the United States, um, depending on where you're counting, how you're counting, that sort of thing. But it's a big deal. And what's being proposed here uh, is a very static rule curve um, that the Corps of Engineers uh, have been using forever. And if you're an if you're a engineer within the Corps, you've been doing that very successfully. Uh, very, I don't know of a lot of examples when you have evacuated a flood, a flood pool per Corps guidance and had a flood that caused damages or significant damages. The way that they've done it is super great if you're interested in flood control. If you're interested in water supply, um, Any time that there's empty space at the end of that flood control season, you're not doing a good job. Uh, so at Folsom, uh, the, the concept here is that there's a static uh, flood control pool, and then there is this variable, oh, I don't know how to use this thing. Um, and then there's this variable space that's shown there between 400 and 600 uh, that allows for a significant amount of storage capacity that's informed through uh, forecast. It's not necessarily season or, seasonal or subseasonal in this case. Uh, this is informed directly by um, River Forecast Center, NOAA products, looking out at um, a number of days to a week that informs that type of thing. Uh, but again, 
the time is now, this is a significant, um, I don't know if improvement's the right word, uh, but approach that the federal government is taking, uh, particularly um, these agencies and the advancements in, in, on these time scales uh, in terms of forecasting are informing real world decisions right now. Um, and I think that's great. Um, so uh, going backwards doesn't help when you have a picture coming after the slide, uh, but that's uh, Folsom and the JFP. Um, again, uh, real world needs on this time scale, the Colorado River Basin uh, is experiencing historic, uh, not tree ring historic, but historic droughts. Um, uh, many of you focus on that here. Um, the Colorado River is informed by, real world management is informed by um, outlooks, two year outlooks, the 24 month study that uh, has official release dates twice a year. Uh, you guys are all, uh, I don't know all of you, but you all seem smart enough to do the math, that um, if, if you're looking out 24 months, two times a year, uh, you need a forecast that has uh, some range to it. Um, currently and historically, uh, there's a switch from where we think we have knowledge to climatology within that 24 months. Uh, informing those processes would certainly help manage that system uh, if we improve outlooks and time scales on the Colorado River. Uh, right now, uh, there has never yet been a shortage declared on the lower Colorado. Uh, there is a significant chance of that happening for the first time in history since Hoover and Neve have been built. Um, uh, looks like there's a picture being taken, I'll wait. <laughs> Uh, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about, again, uh, we recognize the need for these types of improvements and I'm glad that you do as well. Uh, one thing that I'd like to highlight with the remainder of my time, which I have no idea how much there is, five minutes, three minutes? Five minutes. Five minutes. Well, thank you. I take it out of Roger's time, by the way. <laughs> um, is uh, something that we started um, last, when we, this project we started last year. But in the past four or five years, Reclamation uh, has embarked on prize challenges. Um, prize challenges, if you think uh, uh, the X Project, X Prize, uh, an award to for the first private entity to put a rocket into space, we're not, talk, we're not talking that scale, uh, but the concept here is that the federal government puts out a purse for somebody to achieve something. You only pay the purse if somebody is able to do it. Um, and uh, from an economic standpoint, it is a great investment of federal dollars. Uh, we get asked at all levels of the budgetary process, why is this good? It's good because if you count the number of intelligent people spending hours working on our projects, it far outweighs the investment that we're making, far outweighs it. Um, so one thing we focus on, our biggest prize challenge to date, uh, we did last year, uh, we called it the forecast rodeo. It was a year-long, real-time, sub-seasonal forecasting op, uh, contest. Uh, the total number of prizes available for this were $800,000 of federal dollars. Um, it, it seems like a lot of money. Um, and uh, what, what, what the requirements were are these bullets, uh, but essentially uh, competitors had to produce a one-by-one -one degree grid uh, for the Western United States. Uh, projecting temperature and precipitation at two different outlooks, three to four week and five to six weeks. They had to produce these forecasts every two weeks for 13 months. Um, uh, and the, again, the domain, the 17 Western states, basically west of the Mississippi. Uh, to be eligible to win a prize, um, a competitor had to beat uh, two different benchmarks, one being a damp persistence model and the other being NOAA CFS version two. So uh, state of the art uh, weather or climate model, uh, depending on what you want to call it, and a very fundamental ba uh, basic damp persistence statistical approach. Um, um, to win the prize as well, uh, competitors had to uh, submit their code, documentation, and produce a hindcast verification. Um, so it was a complicated project for a competitor to be a part of, uh, but our hope was that by 
that there was enough incentive there that people would want to compete. Um, and what we found is uh, a complicated slide. Uh, uh, but so this completed in June of this past year, June of 2018. Uh, that was the end of the 13 months of the competition. Um, and um, just to show uh, kind of what, what's out there is again, uh, so there's four variables, temperature and precipitation for two different outlooks. So week three and four temperature precipitation, you see in bold the two benchmark, uh, so damp persistence and CFS version two. So there were three competitors that beat the benchmarks, um, which I think uh, we hope to learn quite a bit from, but we're very happy for this outcome. It means that there are very innovative people out there that can beat um, the big dogs in the room, basically. I mean, uh, that's CFS version two. That's a significant federal investment and time that goes into that. Um, similarly, for weeks five and six temperature, uh, we had one competitor beat CFS version two. Uh, for week three and four precipitation, uh, there were uh, three competitors that beat um, benchmarks. And for precipitation, uh, there were a number of uh, competitors that beat precipitate, uh, beat the benchmarks. Um, so this was our uh, prize challenge. We can talk a lot about this and dig into it, uh, but the pitch I'd like to make again to um, all of the smart people in this room, particularly the academics who can compete in this, is we're gonna launch the same prize challenge again. Um, and would love to see more competitors um, this next round. Um, interestingly, um, we had a competitor, um, uh, a, a part of this, that felt that they um, were better off not taking a significant portion of the potential award money because they, they believe that the monetary value of their product is more outside of what we offer in the prize. And we did not take IP, uh, intellectual property associated with this prize challenge, but we took the right to see it. Um, and that even that was enough that the value was more to this in, in, uh, this team or individual uh, to seek privatization, which from our perspective is a fantastic outcome too. I mean, our job in the federal role is to encourage the development, whether it be in the private sector or in the federal government. Um, so for those of you uh, in this room um, that seek grants, seek opportunities, we think that there's a lot of economic value to these things, um, and we encourage you to participate in the competition in the next round. Uh, I believe that's my five minutes, yep. um, and I'll end with my opening comments, which is uh, we would like to help set the target for research, um, and I think there's a fantastic opportunity uh, to discuss exactly what the target looks like in federal water management. I think it would be educational, perhaps disheartening to some of you, uh, but certainly educational in terms of what the real world practice is um, uh, throughout the United States. Uh, so thank you very much for this opportunity. Great, thank you, David. And we all love a good competition, so. Next up is Janine Jones from California Department of Water Resources. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. I know that uh, this is the after lunch time slot, so I will tr uh, make a point of being provocative enough to hopefully keep you awake. Actually, when I talk about that sub this subject, that's not hard. So uh, we asked this question, every year about this time of year, what's the water year going to be like? Because this is very, very important for those of us in the uh, Western US. There we go. So uh, the question was asked uh, earlier about uh, can they do better than the old farmer's almanac? Well, here is uh, CPC's uh, um, uh, report card on their skill score for their seasonal outlooks two-week lead precipitation for DJF, which is a very the most important part of our water year in California in terms of precipitation. Um, well, the good news is that some parts of the country have a, an ENSO signal, not California, not have anything of any significance in the Colorado River Basin. So we think of El Nino as El No Show. And basically, this is a skill of zero, realistically speaking. It has no value for water management at this point. So that's not a good thing. 
So we've wanted better forecasts at an S2S timescale for a long time. We did a great report at DWR um, following up a big drought in the 1970s, desirable to a develop additional skill in forecasting the weather month tense, what's really needed for O&M of a complex water supply project is a long-term projection, at least a year in advance, with a high degree of reliability. So, you know, please get on with it. Uh, but even as recently as 2015, when NOAA published its first ever service assessment for drought for the California drought in 2014, they went out and interviewed a wide cross-section of stakeholders the number one comment they got was, hey, we need seasonal precipitation forecasting capability. Well, hello? It took you that long to figure that out? Um, you know, this is basic and fundamental and something that we could really use for our decision making. So uh, taking a riff here off of NOAA's research funnel, which um, seems to resonate uh, with them, this is the seasonal water management funnel for decision making in California. The top of the funnel, the beginning of the wet season, is where decisions have the most value. We're talking about decisions on the order of hundreds of millions of dollars, particularly for the drought. Should we go to the legislature and ask for major infusions of emergency drought money? Should we do a state water banking program, drought water bank program, as we have done in past droughts? Should we put a whole lot of money into water conservation programs? Do local agencies negotiate temporary water transfers? But as the season goes, and at the beginning of the season, you have quite a bit of discretion in terms of being able to put something in place with enough lead time for decision making. Lead time is golden. And that's why we're really focusing on precip here, is we need the lead time. Runoff forecasts are good. We actually do relatively well on them. Uh, particularly in comparison to those longer term precip forecasts. By the time you get down to the end of the wet season, you have no discretion left to play with, and you're down to business as usual in terms of the value in your decision making. So Grant in his remarks was talking about just the value of getting something out to two weeks. You know, that's a, a weather time scale. But imagine if you could get that to two months, three months. Now, I know obviously your forecast certainty tends to get much better as you get into shorter lead times, but we don't want you to have the easy challenge. We want you to have the stretch challenge, which is give me these answers at a seasonal schedule. And we were asked to talk about challenges, opportunities, and research needs in these remarks. So my challenges. Well, obviously the federal government needs to put more research money into this. S2S has really been the poor stepchild of research, in my opinion. You know, a lot of investment at the longer term climate change time scales through the, um, uh, uh, you know, work over several decades um, in that area. You know, money has gone into weather forecasting, but not a whole lot into S2S. So we were delighted to see when the Weather Research Act was passed in 2017. It was a good first start. Uh, however, it needs to be reauthorized now because it was only a two year authorization. Another challenge, given the uh, what was teed up in the Weather Research Act, is well, how exactly does that fit in NOAA's organizational structure? One of the challenges for us has been figuring out how we readily engage NOAA, where you have little pieces of S2S sort of scattered across a variety of different places in NOAA on the research side as well as on the operations side. And frankly, we need a really focused effort within NOAA something similar to the Hurricane uh, Forecasting Improvement Project, which I think is probably one of the, the best models out there that we could look at. And so I said that working with NOAA was a challenge. Well, it's even harder to work with academia. Uh, all of the work that we have been doing in California to try and advance the cause of S2S forecasting, I almost put in a slide of the cartoon with a big game hunter stalking something with a, dart, with a tranquilizer dart gun the target for that tranquilizer dart gun would be an atmospheric scientist. Uh, it's been very <laughs> difficult to find folks in the atmospheric science community who are interested, willing, and able to work with us to do useful things as opposed to, oh, well, let's publish a paper on something. So uh, the social scientist folks use the term push versus pull. So from our perspective on this, it's been all pull, and it also appears to be a really small research community because Hello, researchers follow the dollars, and a lot of the dollars have been going in other areas. Opportunities. I mentioned the Weather Research Act. That's a huge one. We need to get that reauthorized, 
and we need to use that act to get going on some geographically focused pilot projects. You saw the CPC map of skill scores that I showed. Some areas in the country have a little bit of skill, some don't. Well, hey, the U.S. is a big country. You would expect that some phenomenon give you more predictability in parts of the country versus others. For us in the West Coast, atmospheric rivers. So we think it would be a logical thing to start doing some specific pilot, pilot projects to get skill in those areas where there is not skill, such as winter precip in the western U.S. or, you know, for the ag folks in the Midwest, summer precip for them perhaps is important. Uh, NOAA. We would suggest that in order to take advantage of implementation of the Weather Research uh, Act, um, we need NOAA to develop a, a, some kind of cross-line office organizational structure that brings together a very specific focus uh, within NOAA on this because, for example, um, we just executed a contract with NOAA for work in week zero to four, so we go out two weeks into sub-seasonal, 750k a year for five years to fund NOAA to improve some of its uh, basically weather-ish stuff as opposed to S2S stuff, but it was quite a discussion to figure out, well, who in NOAA do we contract with? Uh, I'd initially approached Dave DeWitt, and I want to give a big shout out to Dave for his willingness to work with us and to be our partner in this. But, you know, a lot of that work was actually being done in Estrel, so we ended up doing the contract with Estrel. But, you know, there's also a relationship with GFDL, which I'll touch on in a minute. So, you know, how do we bring this together in one place and have kind of a one-stop shopping and decision point for S2S and NOAA? Um, I mentioned, you know, from our perspective, one thing we can do as a state, even though we are not a research funding entity, uh, we can fund folks to do specific projects for us that may add value. So we have a contract with Dwayne, for example, at, uh, on behalf of NASA JPL to develop some experimental forecasts of atmospheric rivers for us going out week three, week four. And we're now amending that to do experimental forecasts of West Coast ridging. Because if we have a strong ridge in place in the West Coast, that probably means we're not getting rain, and that may have more prediction skill than trying to forecast atmospheric river probabilities. And that was actually analogous. I was very interested to see the slide that Andy showed this morning in his talk. Uh, we have a contract that we're negotiating now that will involve Scripps and SUNY, one component of which, since this is a question that came up this morning, was about the use of LIM. One of the tasks in that contract will be about the use of linear inverse modeling to look at a six-week experimental forecast for atmospheric rivers or the ability to do so. So we are you know, trying to um, come up with as many things as we can, particularly the other question that was asked this morning about bridging the gap between QPFs and the seasonal outlooks. Well, maybe it's these experimental forecasts three, four, five, six weeks out on ARs. That's something that we've been tracking at this point. So, you know, I'm not going to tell you what my science research needs are because you guys literally wrote the book, that report with the 10-year vision for um, the forecast on S2S timescale being as useful as the weather forecast today. So I just need the research that answers those two questions accurately. And could we please do this within five years because we do have water management challenges in California and we'd, you know, like to get this moving along? Yeah, just saying. And uh, to point out, uh, this is, since we have many atmospheric scientists in the audience, I, you guys always have to have the cool graphics. So this is a cool graphic that I stole from Dwayne. And this is actually an example of uh, one of the work products that he's doing for us under our contract. And he actually showed another version of this in one of his slides this morning. But just an example of the kinds of things that we're trying to pursue in working with the research community in getting very targeted products that could be useful. And another example of something that I think is an interesting pending opportunity that's coming up, some recent research that GFDL published regarding the ability to seasonally predict western snowpack, which would be so hugely useful for us. And uh, Dave and uh, Sarah Kapnick and uh, Tom Hamill and others, at my request, worked together to put together a prospectus of what would it actually take to do this? not just quote unquote study western snowpack, but develop a target with a plan, a process, a schedule, and an idea of cost of what, would, what could you do in five years with this. And at my request, they presented it at our recent Western States Water Council fall meeting. This is the kind of thing that we need to see from NOAA, from the research community, specific products, specific time periods, specific tasks, 
What does it take? It makes it much easier to sell the research in our world. So with that, I would just to point out, not just a California perspective, I'm here also on behalf of Western States Water Council. We see a huge need for improving S2S forecasting, and we're very interested in working with folks, including the folks who signed NOAA's budget, to uh, try and get resources into this task. So that's where I wrap up. Great, thank you, Janine. And last, Roger's up. Yeah. In about 15 minutes, hopefully. Yay. Greetings. Uh, so I'm Roger Fowardy. I'm going to talk a little bit about the issue of drought and um, water supply and demand. There's a lot of work, a lot of partnerships we have with the Western Governors, with Janine, who helped us lead a lot of this stuff. But the whole idea is what's the breadth of the kinds of questions we're trying to deal with across uh, time scales and then specifically at uh, S2S and why that's a, what kind of challenges that poses. A lot of these fit into very di direct networks that we've developed for early warning around the country that's made up of watershed managers, a very diverse group that I'll point to in a second. But watershed managers, ecosystem managers, certainly um, even broader issues such as lower and upper basin challenges in the Colorado River and then some international aspects. So I'm going to mention the big challenge we have in the drought world on this time scale, which are flash droughts. I'll talk about the focusing event, the thing that really brought the attention of short-term uh, drought expansion and severity into our thinking, then something that happened in the upper Midwest that leads to some of Janine's questions that we did not predict, which is the upper Midwest drought in 2017, and then something that's beginning to challenge a lot of our stakeholders and our partners, the issue of compound events, droughts to floods and back, and then the combination of drought and heat and why that matters. And we're getting a lot of attention from the health community on exactly that question. And some of the cases I'll show are a combination of national and international applications in ag and the famine early warning system network. Uh, and all of these are work we've done to develop through not only in the National Integrated Drought Information System, but the International Drought Management Program at uh, WMO and the scientific basis therein. Finally, it will be where the research and information products advances actually needed. So there's a big list. There's the billion dollar droughts affecting the consumer price index done by NCEI. And why do we care? Well, across timescales, you can see where we have drought related risks and where they tend to impact the consumer price index. This is the first time an analysis like that has ever been done. For a whole long time since the 1930s drought, we've always thought of drought as an agricultural impact. And boy, you could get the insured losses and when you look at the billion dollar disasters, you almost see nothing in the West from a billion dollar disaster from drought. Yet we know that the cost as it filters through the water systems and everything else are in fact in the billions. In fact, we estimate that the 2012 drought, when you accumulate all of the risk and with this work with Munich Re was actually $100 billion. And Hurricane Sandy was about 60 to 70 billion. It just all happened at once. So we have to keep in mind these ideas of the cumulative impacts and cumulative risk. And of course, as people mentioned, when we visit the other issue that this is central to, wildfires. And we can go back, we did a full analysis of why we're seeing some of the, the explosions, not just in the long-term trends, but what the short-term means in the context of explosive events. So drought is typically the largest driver of crop disaster assistance and indemnity payments. We estimated in 2012 about $9 billion was paid out, even though the cumulative impact losses were about $100 billion. So what does this mean for us? What actually happened? This focus event, the reason why I call it that, that led to the creation of the National Drought Resilience Partnership, a multi-agency group that is functioning, uh, now chaired by the EPA uh, head of water, Dave Ross, and um, Bill Northey, who's from the USDA Conservation Authority. And here's the drought. There's 2011. There's May 2012, July 2012, January 2013. And the jump we can see from around May to July went from about 30%, it actually ended up being 66% by September of the aerial extent of drought. Now that's pretty dramatic from the standpoint of the evolution of a drought event. I always tell people when dealing with drought, the onset is not quite the issue. The onset, we have got markets, we've got storage. It's when we've used up those buffers and a drought has intensified that you actually have the risk. And where we're seeing the importance of the S2S timescale is in terms of the intensification in short periods relative to drought. 
So there's that big leap, and this was done through the NOAA Drought Task Force. The percent of U.S. experience monitoring to se severe drought suddenly increased, but even a perfect sea surface temperature prediction would likely have captured much less than half of the total variance. And what is the rest? A complete explanation of droughts invoked not just the ocean boundary forcing, but also the particular sequence of internal variability. And this is what we focus on in the context of trying to get the sense of why those leaps have occurred. One of the indices we've developed, and it's a parallel to the evaporative stress index, is the thirst of the atmosphere. How much water does the atmosphere pick up? There's the two-week evaporative demand drought index. There's the U.S. drought monitor next to it. As you can see, the atmosphere is trying, starting to pull water out of the system by June, by July, and there's August. And so due to these land atmosphere feedback, the evaporative demand actually reflected the surface moisture conditions much ahead of even the drought monitor. And it happened over this time frame that is so critical to whether or not we saw the ballooning of this drought event. But why did that matter? For a lot of decisions, and we worked with USDA and others on this, the reserve for forage supply going through the year, people were reducing herd sizes, weaning calves early, purchasing feed, renting additional pasture. One of the strongest adaptive mechanisms we have in the United States is actually the Conservation Reserve Program. 2.4 million acres that were put aside after the Dust Bowl to give us some buffer in the system. The application for government assistance, incorporating yearly, uh, the yearling livestock, and then stocking conservatively. These are actual decisions that people make. And then it matters a great deal to where they get the loans to do these things. So the banking industry has taken now a big interest on whether or not loans are actually viable and they prove the premium on them. And this is actually a critical thing from the time frame of how these decisions are made. But something else was going on, as people in this room know. The grain and oil seeds dominate the southbound traffic on the, on the Mississippi, accounting for one, about half, a million, um, half of the 80 million metric tons. If we amortize all of the traffic that goes up and down each year, in, including repeat traffic, just the cost of things that travel on the Mississippi back and forth, it's over a trillion dollars a year just things that move all the way along the Mississippi. It is the most economically viable, is the most economically important watershed in the world. And during that event, we had huge impacts, both from dredging in the short term, and most significantly, in the very short term, the inability of grain elevators to load things onto barges. Even though it had been low, coming from May to July, everything just dropped altogether. So as a result, the Mississippi River Cities and Towns Initiative, the coalition of 70, over 70 mayors is working with us very closely on what does it mean for their communities when a large scale event like that happens, what it matters to the trade footprint of the United States, and the USDA is helping to fund this, and how this then filters into the activities for relief and for alternative sources of not just employment, but recreation on these 80 towns. That's actually happening and in progress right now, came out of this event, and it's all because of that surprising jump at that time. So we're talking about why we need to know this stuff for a little bit, why we need to know those time frames, And of course, another one of those, and we saw in California as well in 2016, 2017, was this issue of from too much to too little and back. From 2010, 2012, those were three years in which corn yield fell for the first time since the Dust Bowl we have little sense of how things shifted from very wet to very dry so quickly. And that transition from wet to dry is actually one of the most critical things in the context of planning. We've seen other things like that in 19, early 1990s. We had um, events like that on the Colorado River. It's just that 87 to 92 was a dry period and so the reservoirs refilled. We saw it again in 1983 um, when, the, when Lake, uh, the reservoir on um, Lake Powell almost broke. The idea here is what changes as we see droughts to floods and back again. And that rapid transition actually occurs on this time frame, And we have little sense of how that happened. So in the NIDAS reauthorization and in the new bill that has been approved by the Senate and is in the House right now, there's strong, and, and actually quite honestly, and I'll give Janine a lot of credit for this as well, a lot of language on including research related to the role of extreme weather events and variability in ameliorating droughts or in making us think we've ameliorated droughts. As I always like to tell people, early warning is like taking your car to the mechanic and she says, 
I couldn't fix your brake, so I fixed your horn. <laughs> it's a warning. It doesn't mean we're doing anything about it, right? And so the idea, though, is putting this kind of information into our early warning systems. But we have a predictability problem. The upper Midwest drought onset was not forecast as lead time sufficient for early warning to lead to early action. No mistake on our parts. Everywhere, CPC, PSD, all of us were using the best available science, but we could not pick this one up. And it led to a lot of impacts in barley and wheat production on, in this part of the world. Right? But the real issue that happened in there was this rapid soil moisture decline. And we do not yet know why that happened. Look at the time frame on which it happened in a matter of weeks to about two months in which you saw that very rapid decline in soil moisture. And that's a question for us to think about in terms of the types of questions we want to answer. So in another area of work that we do, we're very closely with the Famine Early Warning System Network. Um, we help create the International Drought Management Program that deals with drought risk and drought impacts. When we go from emergency and response, we're usually behind the curve. By the time the drought appeals occur, and by the time a drought response happens, it's too late. And the question is, what does research on the SRS timeframe give us in terms of being able to manage this process? And I can go in great detail about this particular case. This is one of the successes of the use of a forecast on that timeframe. Understanding the ENSO signal and then what that meant not simply for a wetter or drier season, but what events, the number of events within that season that led to being wetter or drier. There's the food security map uh, in February 2016, and there's the food security map in June 2016. A lot lower risk for food security. The whole idea was that this drought in Ethiopia was actually the worst drought in 60 years, worse than the 1984 drought that was, you know, Live Aid and Band Aid and everything else, right? which killed 400 to 600,000 people. In this case, this humanitarian crisis actually did not occur. Because of the work of USGS, NASA, NOAA, and partners on the ground on mapping household food security, being able to get food in place on this time frame, we did not see a collapse in Ethiopia as a result. You didn't know about this. It happened in Somalia because it did not become a crisis. And so that occurred actually on the time frame that we're talking about. So widespread acute food insecurity was avoided in Ethiopia in 2015, 2016 because of early warning of subseasonal potential food insecurity and the social safety nets that had been put into place as a result of FuseNet and so on. The coordinated information system and services actually led us to be able to assess food insecurity and support resource prepositioning. And that link occurred, the new director of FuseNet was actually my, de my deputy at NIDAS. There's a strong link between these two framings and how we think through these issues. Something else we're beginning to see, and this is a really cool study from Amir Kushak and others, is exactly the droughts warming faster than the average climate. But what we're seeing are more heat waves when we do have a drought. And so the heat wave question becomes a big issue for the health community. And we're seeing it throughout the United States. That idea of the temperature shifts when you do have a drought is actually not simply a health issue. As people in the room know, it affects what you see in vegetation. It affects what you see in evapotranspiration. We estimate, Dave, we lose about, what, one, one and a half to two million acre feet of water from just heat on all the reservoirs on the Colorado Basin. And how does this impact us? The all, outside of tropical hurricanes, the combination of drought and heat is actually a mortality risk in the United States that we don't fully appreciate. Almost 3,000 deaths from those, the percent frequency and the cost are much higher than we actually think when we add these two together, $240 billion calculated over that time. And we're seeing this. There's the Southwest for the temperature changes that you see all throughout this period. And then when you have drought, clearly a link between drought and heat. Yeah, that's obvious until you begin to think in terms of heat waves being the heat that you're actually constructing during that time. There's just an example. There's a fifth precipitation for, uh, for 2014. It was the fifth on record. But the thing that happened was the warmest November to April mean temperature. That combination certainly played a role in exacerbating the California drought. There's an increasing set of things. I sit on something called the National Drought Resilience Partnership. Across that group, homeland security, 
Energy and others are beginning to look at how drought-related critical infrastructure ha hazards are affecting us on the water energy food nexus. And I can go through the list of things on infrastructure. And this is all new because for a long time, we thought of drought as simply affecting agriculture. We're beginning to see it affecting the functioning of infrastructure, not just transportation, but the functioning of our electric lines, things like that, when you get the combination of heat waves and drought. So what are the research needs? For monitoring, and a lot of this comes from work from Dave DeWitt and a whole host of others, using new observations, soil moisture, getting the land surface initialization, I'll mention that in a sec, identifying the sources of predictability on these timescales, given a changed base state, and improvements in, in, by using multiple models and, and a set of initial conditions that I'll mention in a second. And there it is. Our case is really beginning to get a better sense of the, not only the systematic biases in the models, but how the land surface initialization is occurring. Because once that feedback starts happening, we see these ballooning of large drought events. So from the operational climate prediction monitoring products, this is from Dave and a whole host of others, certainly ENSO and MJO monitoring, the link between the seasonal and how that modulates the week three to four temperature and precipitation outlooks, the drought monitor, but really the monthly and seasonal outlook and the role uh, that evapotranspiration and evaporative demand both plays and the land surface conditions that affects our outlooks. So taking that from that standpoint, there are the sources of predictability, the way we look at it, but the main thing is the fault there is, Brutus, is not in our stars, but in our boundary conditions. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. Great, thank you, Roger. Um, so great uh, presentations there, and I think a lot for us to think about for uh, discussion. We've got about an hour, assuming we go till 3 p.m. Um, so I'll take questions, but before um, we do that, I wanted to say I, I contacted a, a colleague at NCAR, and there's two papers that are out on the National Water Model. Uh, they're early papers, and they're, I guess they're in the process of drafting more, but I sent them to Ravi and Kathy, so we'll make those available. So one's in Journal of Hydrology, and one is in JARA. So there are two papers kind of from early development of the National Water Model. So those will be out there. Um, so with that, I guess we'll open it up for questions. I do have some questions that I kind of came up with with a few of my colleagues on, the, on BASC. And they're put up there. Um, I think that third bullet, um, we heard a lot about kind of timeframes, at least from uh, Janine, and what's kind of needed for her um, agency and group. But these are some things to keep in the back of the mind. A lot of the first ones are kind of like, what are your, what are your needs uh, in, from the agencies and stakeholders from us? Uh, a question about uncertainty quantification and the products that you're using. Um, modeling capabilities and observations needed uh, currently that you think we can provide or help develop. And then I, I kind of wanted to end hopefully with a little bit on workforce development and what do you see as kind of needed in your future employee? Those of us that are academics in the room, you know, what skills do you see that your employees need? What's lacking? I mean, something for us to think about as we go back to our institution. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. And maybe we need a coffee break. <laughs> All right. Ravi, you can start us rolling. Thank you. This is absolutely a fascinating session. Um, not just because Roger spoke. Um, in, yeah. <laughs> um, I had a kind of systems question. It occurs to me that the way you manage water, maybe it's akin to the way you manage uh, other utilities in some ways. Um, multiple sources of water, multiple issues and how you deal with it. Do you see that as a model for dealing with it? In other words, uh, let, let me be more specific. For example, Tampa Bay, do you have enough capacity in desalinization to take up for any loss you might have in other systems? Now? Uh, now? Yeah. Now, no, because it's only five to. So right now it's only five to ten percent of the the total that come from desalinated uh, seawater. Um, 
in the future, one of the planning we're looking is expanding that source as, uh, as well as other sources too. Uh, but I will tell you right now, it's almost four times expensive than the groundwater. Uh, and that's the most expensive source. So we have to figure out how to balance and people doesn't want to pay anymore. <laughs> the last seven years, we haven't increased one cent. And it seems that people are get too used to this no more increase. And that's yes. the challenge. I'm sorry to push on this, but you know, people seem to pay for gasoline price changes much larger than that. And you can do without gasoline for significant amounts of time, but not without water. So it seems to me there's something that's missing in that equation. Uh, it, in other words, in all the different water management systems, do you have redundancies and multiple uh, kind of sources of water that you manage? Go ahead. Uh, you know the saying, you get what you pay for. Large water utilities have the capacity because they have large ratepayer bases uh, and typically a lot of staff resources to afford higher levels of reliability of supply. Uh, in California, where we see our immediate public health and safety impacts with respect to drinking water in droughts tends to come from small water systems particularly small water systems on fractured rock groundwater that may only have a few hundred or a couple thousand connections because they don't have a large enough rate base to be able to afford reliability and that's where we end up going in as a state and perhaps doing emergency response actions during a drought such as water haulage, uh, bulk water haulage, uh, even um, drilling wells, et cetera, for local agencies. So it's very much a locally specific impact. Other comments from the panel on that, or David? Uh, uh, just to reiterate Janine's comment again, and at a lunch conversation on the opposite end of the spectrum are things like the Southern Nevada Water Authority, which has a very large rate base, has recently spent uh, close to a billion dollars in terms of ensuring some reliability through adding a an additional intake into Lake Mead, uh, such that they saw the risks of, uh, of Lake Mead elevations exceeding their risk tolerance and had the rate base to increase reliability through that standpoint. Uh, and I'll just add, speaking to this morning's conversation on the importance, for lack of a better word, of aquifers, is that the federal government has provided subsidies for decades um, on in times of drought, what are we gonna do? We're gonna drill more wells. Um, it wasn't until recently that policies have shifted to discourage uh, additional well during times of drought and uh, shifting the funding for drought preparation. Uh, that doesn't solve the issue, uh, but the historic response has been to build reliability by tapping into those aquifers. So, Ravi, I think there's, there's a fundamental backdrop you know, the base state question that I think you're asking, which is the effort to which we have redundancy in our system and the effort to which we have pricing in our system. And, and it's pretty clear that whenever we have created redundancy in water systems, we have then developed enough to use that redundancy. In other words, all, whenever we think we've saved something, development has pushed forward to use that saving. One of the things we sort of need to get a little bit, as, as you're, you're leading us to think through here, is, as people know, everyone in the, uh, in the audience, we have, in fact, lowered the amount of water that we use in total since about 1975 across the United States, and it has not shown a blip in GDP or in productivity. From that standpoint, if we can ask the question that the idea of reclamation or the idea of efficiency is not simply a question of using the last drop, but actually you can do upfront savings that give you upfront benefits. Then you get over the hurdle of what's the barrier to the upfront cost that is the major barrier to adaptation that we have. Have a follow-up, please? Sure, absolutely. Okay, the reason I asked this question is, 
if you were to think from the academic perspective of if you want to a study of any kind related to this issue who who are the other players that have to be involved in this i mean it's not just the water studies or you the economist the economist huh the economist of water um so water is a hev- heavily subsidized entity in the united states and it's not managed by any one thing uh it's uh in the west it's um first in time first in right in the east it's uh adjacency um there are crop subsidies that affect demands uh there are repayment uh repayment differences with respect to the federal infrastructure in the united states it dates back 100 years um this is uh the questions you were asking about the water systems and their reliability are an economics question what about the social science yeah well we'll talk like that yeah so so i want to bring it back to why the s to s time scale matters to a question like that because if you're asking a long term resilience and sustainability question we should ask whether or not the s to s time frame offers an entry point for us what do we need to get ready to be act to act in that time frame right and and within the work we're doing with the world bank and elsewhere there's a, a feature called the sovereign liquidity risk which is how do you do an investment that gets you the research you need on the near term that also helps you with long term planning so i just want to bring us back to why this time frame matters to both the boundary as well as dealing with the extremes and responses to those there's there's a criticality for the types of science and partnerships that you heard from the panel and from people earlier that needs to be in place to act during those time frames i should also add um the reservoir for example we have is an within a year so we drain we fill within a single year which is completely different from the waste so going back to Roger's point the the ability to forecast and managing that resource is huge uh and and that will um, also increase the trust of of decision makers operators on our ability to forecast and manage that resources if not they will just say hey let's go and invest and we are trying to figure out we can we manage as we go through and we bring infrastructure only when we have to because the last thing you want to do is you build something and that's an stranded asset maybe you're going to use it once in 20 years so that's the the balance so your reliability on one side and then the the your willingness to pay for that reliability all right we'll move on to the next question david and then i have dave and then david so it's the three david <laughs> wait no dave some luck first yeah. yeah i'm going to i'm going to on jonathan I'm going to sneak two in here because I can't imagine I'll get another chance for a question. <laughs> we'll let you do that, Dave. You uh, have the, one question with two parts. The, the, the first one is about the S2S and who's missing from this discussion that might be useful if the academy thinks forward about a, a study. And two groups that come to my mind are um, the U.S. military and then people who think about farm commodities prices or uh insurance risk and i'm kind of curious if people have ideas of other federal agencies or people in the private sector who would want to uh be involved in a, a future study or or research of this nature and the other question is for Roger because you made a comment about economic damage associated with droughts and i think 100 billion dollars or something like that and i don't think that's generally well understood or accepted and i wonder if you could amplify on that and and tell us what the naysayers who disagree with that might might sure. say to that assertion yeah you want to go with them okay yeah and then you can add so the answer to the first part of the question on uh defense and on financial services definitely I just didn't want to make it the comment just about economics because part of the issue is so much of our values are tied up in water that is beyond just that. The case I was pointing to in Ethiopia actually had a lot of repercussions back with our partners in defense because in staving off a humanitarian crisis you may have staved off a conflict. 
when it comes to that large number, and my reason for putting it out there as a, a in, it was um, the way Munich Re calculated what in fact had been lost, not simply by the insured loss to the crops, but the fact that barging started to lose money, that recreational systems started losing, when they put it all together, and there has to be double counting in it because we have no models that actually can get at a full sense other than implant, which is only state level, a full sense of the cumulative impact of a drought risk over time. We don't actually. Anybody that makes, gives you a number like that is wrong. <laughs> they, we do it. And when they took, the insurers took the numbers for what was lost in the markets internationally, they came up with $100 billion over that time. But, but flipping it around, someone else made more, more money on crop. Right. So when, you do, so when you do a net, and that applies everywhere, right? If you build next to a levy, you've lost the, where people would have built. So when we amortize risk over a large region in, in a certain out, input-output sense, we'll, we're adding up pluses and minuses all over the place. The question is, why and to what extent is something locally significant that drives our understanding of risk? Because we could do pluses and minuses, and we do this all the time for um, the, especially the reinsurers, that can end up to be wherever somebody loses, somebody else benefits. But what I'm interested in is whether or not people suffer as a result of that benefit. And you can't amortize suffering. <laughs> that makes sense. I mean. Okay, David over here. Yes, great. Fascinating panel. And, um, I have a question for uh, Janine, and others may want to uh, jump in on this. So, Janine, you were talking about the difficulty in finding partners and tools, and I suspect that at least part of that challenge is the need for very local forecasting. You know, a lot of uh, projects take place on specific sites and specific locations, and I can think about the kind of resolution we seek for urban rainfall on trying to address uh, issues uh, related to uh, combined sewer overflows and, and the like. Uh, so the, I, the need for very local forecasting and the role for empirical models uh, based on historical trends, if we have data in particular locations versus physics-based mechanistic models over large areas. And uh, you know, you find both of those in the literature and I, I uh, the, the, the empirical approach doesn't get as much attention, but uh, may be more uh, appropriate for the kind of local forecasting needed. And, and Janine, if you'd comment on that. And, and for Janine or anyone, side-by-side uh, -side comparison of models for very localized forecasting, is there a need for that? How much of that has been done? Well, keeping in mind the present accuracy or lack thereof of S2S forecasting, and the fact that when you're looking out longer term, you're really not looking event-based. You know, you're looking at a probability of having something happen over a fairly large space because, you know, as water managers, we like to think in watersheds, but the reality is the climate system operates in a much broader scale. So from perspective of, say, state of California and looking at drought, uh, I would be delighted if they could get it down to Northern California versus Southern California at an S2S time scale. You know, uh, I have no uh, illusions about getting a probabilistic event-based forecast at six weeks out, let's say. So, you know, it's not in the cards, but generally the will it be wet in this winter? Uh, we've gone through halfway of the winter now. What's the rest of the winter going to look like? So I can make decisions about managing groundwater storage, putting into place late season water transfers, those kinds of things. So I am much less worried at an S2S scale about localized. Just regional would be very good if they could get the, the skill on that. And, you know, statistical or empirical models versus numerical weather models. Uh, there are folks in the room who know the long history of that better than I, with statistical models eventually becoming, shall we say, displaced by the numerical weather models. But uh, when I look at NOAA from the perspective of an outsider, uh, due to their budget limitations, they really haven't kept up on some of the statistical modeling or statistical post-processing that would support or complement 
the numerical weather models. And frankly, some of the little research projects that we're going after uh, are more statistically focused. For example, we're in conversations with a researcher at University of California, Irvine, about what is essentially a statistical seasonal model for precip for California as an experimental product because it is a different approach than that used by the numerical weather modeling folks. And um, I, I probably shouldn't say this in front of a bunch of atmospheric scientists, but given the, the skill of the outlooks at this point, which as I said was non-existent, well, okay, so you have a multi-model ensemble. I could do as well with a multi-model ensemble of magic eight balls at this point, given the skill at that longer lead time. So I am very interested in considering any tool that offers a promise to skill, including the statistical ones. And I should add, uh, I cannot emphasize enough in terms of um, doing localized uh, information. That's exactly what we try to do, Tampa Bay Water. Florida has a very unique conditions. You know, we have both sides and convective rains and so on. Uh, we try to work uh, along Wendy is here with University of Florida as well as Florida State in, uh, climate scientists. One of the things I can tell you a big challenge is that since we get almost more than 60% of our rain during the four months of summer, when that uh, rainy season starts is huge. It can be anywhere from May 26 to 22 to July. Once the rain starts, the climate scientist tells me that the way the convective system works, even people, we have no idea. My wife can tell you tomorrow at three o'clock, it's gonna be thunder and, and it works like that during summer. It's that predictable once you are into that rainy season. But the challenge is how can I predict way before a few months when that summer starts? And we don't have so much time to uh, to harvest that. Like I said, we have only three to four months to fill the entire reservoir that we deplete during uh, spring. So I can't emphasize more in terms of uh, localized knowledge and how you can use. And, and maybe something you said triggered a thought with me a follow up. So, you know, one of the other areas we're exploring is so it's one thing to say take a weather modeling approach, which is initial condition problem and trying to torture that to the limits of predictability there. The other aspect is to take the climate side and try and bring it down and get the two to meet in the middle, because we say S2S is a bridge between weather and climate. Something that we're very interested in starting to explore in California is can we do something to predict regime shifts or transition within the wet season? And that's why as part of our, our task with uh, NASA JPL, we're asking them to give us experimental predictions of West Coast ridging. Because if we have a ridging condition that sets up for weeks to months at a time, that is the big trigger for droughts for us. We have a ridge there, it's not going to be raining, most likely. And it may be easier or more skillful or more amenable to other tools to be able to forecast those transition states. Uh, and one of the tasks that we have for our UC Irvine researcher is we've actually given her a set of years in which we had a significant flip in the climate system during the winter time and say, can you as an initial step diagnose what happened and then let's see if we can tease some predictability out of it. Let me just follow up Sorry, really quickly. Um, if any of the morning speakers or modelers want to follow up to Janine's comment about uh, can the models be better, right? Or how are we for statistical versus our deterministic versus our probabilistic forecast? Shui, are you going to address that? <laughs> no, I'm not addressing it, but I, I would like to uh, get some input from yeah. you. I mean, I'm really delighted to see how much of this interest in this. It is um, in some ways that prediction community has struggled for a long time. And uh, the statistical model, or you know, you will say parametric model based on statistic correlations, uh, hurricane forecast has told us that failed, right? So over so many years, they tend to try to tell you this year going to be Bob normal, and, and you know, at the end of the study recently showed it's no better than toss the coin over so many years because it still is relevant to this S2S. So now to S2S components of this is that 
it is a multi-scale phenomenon. You have a background of ENSO or not ENSO what phases and the triggering time and things. So in a way that I don't know if we know enough to, net, to tell what is predictably on that because all of these are still kind of rare events if you would have to say, unlike your daily weather forecast. So in that sense, we're accumulating that knowledge. But my question to the panel is that how much you see the future is that a dynamic model is coming online. The S2S database uh, sort of a store in the uh, European Center now with multi-model world model reforecast the last 20 years or so, that can be used as a training site. So right now, many of the research community go into that world, try to see what kind of application we can go with. But this requires the local statistical downscaling using that dynamic forecast model. So do you see that as at least the next few years experimental product can be tried out? Uh, I'm going to give you 30 second answer to that, but first I just need to apologize. I'm going to have to run and catch a plane here in just a second, but any follow up, I'd love to communicate with any and all of you uh, in the future. My answer to that goes back to part of the discussion this morning is I don't care. Um, you know, uh, I won't tell you how to do the research. Uh, I'll set the target. You guys give me the answer. Um, that that's my perspective. Um, you, uh, you, you, you know, your job far better than I know your job. You probably know my job better than I know my job. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I don't care. Um, I just need the, the, the forecast. So, yeah, and I have to say that I too am totally agnostic as to how you get the answer, just as long as you get the right answer. Um, but, you know, I think the, the problem with the dynamical modeling right now really harkens back to a lack of sufficient investment. You know, why, for example, is the European weather model so much better than the U.S. weather model? Uh, I think if this suddenly saw a whole lot more resources going into it, and I think one of the things I've learned from my conversations with Dave over the last couple of years is, from his perspective, the critical need for more supercomputing resources for the research to support the research on S2S. And, uh, you know, I didn't realize that was going to be a limiting issue. But so I think it's as much a resource uh, issue as anything. And, you know, one of the things about statistical models is in a warming climate, we are pushing the boundaries. And Stephanie, could you hold up the brochure with the rocks on the cover? Yes, thank you. So that's a, a handout that I put out on the table. It's our wrap up of our last water year. The subtitle on that brochure is Hot, Dry, and on Fire, which very much summarized California's uh, water year last year. But in there, there's a graphic that shows if you plot precip versus temperature by climate division in California, all of the 21st century da uh, data are one standard deviation off of the observed historical mean. So, you know, clearly we are going forward in a condition where we're uh, at the bounds of our observed data set. So, you know, that's a risk we have to think about when we look at statistical models. I just wanted to add one quick thing. I mean, if we're dealing with the idea of extremes across, not just extremes from subseasonal to, to seasonal, but the number of extremes in that setting, and we think in terms of the spread around the PDF around the initial conditions, and whether or not that can actually produce extremes outside of the PDF it start with, started with, I don't think dynamically that's possible. I think as a result, you're going to have to use both to understand how the distribution is shifting as you're moving through time. So I think it's unavoidable to use not only the stochastic parameterization around the, the, pro the processing, but also from the standpoint of saying, how do these anomalies track during time? And I think you have to do that statistically. Uh, question just follow up this I, my point is that this is a new area yeah. that needs yeah. to join learning process yeah. because right now a lot of the things that academic do is a sort of a, some exercise on the end that we think it is to do but then at the yeah. same time there are things belong to what predictable 
large scale dynamic pattern is more predictable than precipitation itself. Yeah. So we would like to learn from your experience locally what kind of things that would drive that joint learning curve. But, but I think that's technically a really good question and, and what the question is, but what Janine was also offering is what space should that happen in? How is that organized, supported, and funded? Because otherwise, we will come back to this discussion as to, you know, is it limb or is it dynamic? And, and so I think where we make those decisions, the help from the academy is creating that brokering to try to get at the organizational model Janine pointed at. We kind of have to move beyond the sort of, um, I know it's, it's seductive to say, just tell me what you want and I'll go back and do the research. Well, that's about a 40 or 50 year old model about how science really occurs, so we kind of have to get over it. But first we have to find some academic, uh, some folks in academia who are willing to work on this. That's the hard part. Hmm. Okay, I've got David, Jonathan, and Andy, do you have a response on the modeling or? Okay, why don't you come up to, that'd be great. Yeah, just, just a, a quick comment on the statistical versus dynamical. So, so from our experience at IRI, I mean, we've always uh, you know, come from the, the standpoint, whatever, whatever works, because uh, we're, we're trying to be trying to improve, you know, seasonal forecasts for decision making. And what we've found in the end is, well, it, it's normally it's a mix of the two. So it's, it's hybrid approaches where we often call that post processing. So it's developing statistical techniques that will use some predictors. I mean, those predictors might be antecedent ones coming from a purely statistical model, or they may be coming from the dynamical model. So I think, you know, it's resonating from many things that have been said this afternoon about, you know, large scale dynamical patterns and so forth. But how can you make use of the information in the dynamical model through statistical methods? So the, the development of, of statistical empirical methods is is uh, extremely important from from uh, you know our ongoing work and our experience from from the seasonal forecasting. Great, thank you. Do you have a response, uh, Mr. So, just hit the right button there, speaker. Yeah, I should add. I should add that. So, what we are talking from is from the climate si uh, side, but there is a cascade of uncertainties that will be going through by the time we, as the water utility uh, you know, managers, make a decision. So for example, at Tampa Bay Water, we use this large scale forecast of ENZO and so on. How ENZO translates to the probability of rainfall is another question. It's not a slam dunk, 70, 80%, yeah, we'll, we'll, there will be rain. By how much? That's a different story. So once we get that rain, and then we translate into another hydrologic, which has its own uncertainty in it too, which we propagate. Then we are using those to make a decision. So it's uh, sometimes, you know, when we, we, we speak, we tell them, ah, we think it's a weak La Nina or a weak El Nino, but at the end of the day, what matters is the rain that comes associated with that large scale uh, signal. Okay, I've got David, then Jonathan, and, and please, uh, visitors along the walls too, sitting in the chairs, you're welcome to ask questions. We've got a microphone, so uh, just flag Carly down. So we'll go to David. Uh, thank you, and thank you, panel, and the one from this morning. I think you guys have really brought to bear for us the amount of data and information that's out there, the need to do a better job of integrating that data, and finding ways to build the tools necessary for the for the public and the private community to use it more effectively. My question more goes to, so I'm gonna take a little bit of a deviation from the current line of the discussion and go more to your bullet five up there. Great, okay. On how do we, are the agencies ready for big data, et cetera? I have, in my career, I've had to spend a lot of time trying to interpret science for policymakers and for legislative purposes. And an example, and Roger, thank you for drawing to the reference to the drought in 2012 on the Mississippi River. You've never lived until you've had a line of um, Iowa soybean farmers show up at your door demanding that you go give direction to the Corps of Engineers to go blow up rocks in the Mississippi River so they can get the barges upstream to get the soybeans and downstream to get it to market uh, to the ships in New Orleans. Um, General Peabody came in and he asked specifically, can Congress give me some cover 
so I can do this because I don't feel I have enough uh, ability just to go out and blow rocks up in the Mississippi River. The point of all that is, is that policy and how our federal and state governments um, utilize science is often a two-edged sword. They will use it as far as they think they're um, covered to use it, but they also are in, in demand. So my question is, and it's for Roger, for you as a both a science agency and as a regulatory agency through the National Marine Fisheries Service. Dave, if he was here for an operations perspective, and maybe Janine, you could reference it because your state does a lot in terms of water management. Is it a function of we don't have the right science or maybe we don't have an integrated that science correctly, or are we lacking the ability for the agencies to use that science in, in a policy format? <laughs> Say yes, Roger. Oh, you, you, you start. Okay. I want to take on the last bit, right? Because that's a critical thing. When Ravi and others were asking, who else do you need? And, you know, we like to rush to say economists. Well, look, we released a FEMA report uh, we need last any year. Roger, uh, that's what I thought, right? See, that's what I, I was going to say, not. Right? But, but what I'm getting at is not that there's something so wrong with that. It's just even when we show the value of upfront action, our actions still don't, aren't commensurate with knowing that value. We've shown that from disasters. What you're asking is a fundamental question in adaptive management. From the standpoint of, yes, we, we spend the morning and we have a lot of reports and, and we have the S2S report telling us what the science is, what we might know. We're coming to the terms with the fact that, yes, we need both you know, the stochastic as well as deterministic aspect. But when it comes to what legitimizes a piece of information for use with the public, that's where the academies needs the partnerships of people who study the organization and legislative aspects of what allows us to get at how can uncertainty quantification not simply be accounted for, but be used in decision making. It can be accounted for, but it'll never be certain. So how it can be used. What we do not have is an agreed upon mechanism that says, until we get this right, there is usable, until we, we figure out what the, the limits to predictability are in this time frame, that we can't act using the information. We do not have a mechanism that allows the agencies to use this because we have fixed rule curves, we have fixed, and you know this better than anyone, we have uh, fixed deliveries to meet. And the question is, how do we get at working with Janine, with Grant, with others on what is an acceptable outcome if we've used all the best available information? And how is this part of the best available knowledge? And I think that gives you the sort of decision-making leeway that is not just an idealized Bayesian approach. So from Tampa Bay Water uh, perspective, and I should caution that Tampa Bay Water is not an example of a utility at all. Uh, maybe a couple of uh, utilities in the U.S. that kind of uh, you know tools and uh, academy. So we, when we say big data, yeah, uh, if if that big data is for the whole U.S., no. But if that big data is covering uh, our area, Florida, uh, we can use those kind of information probabilistic. We have our own uh, internal cloud computing uh, using a lot of machines running parallel. The things I was showing you actually here runs like 80 or so uh, parallel computing. We run the whole thing a maybe three hours. If it was in a simple computer, it would be like a couple of years. So the, the agency make a conscious decision on investing. I'm talking few million dollars, uh, allowing us to do this kind of work so that we are demonstrating that uh, we may be able to push some of our investment in infrastructure. We demonstrated already. If I push two, two years, that's 40, 80 million dollars of investment. So our, my agency did that, but how many of those in the US? That's, you know, that's the problem. How we can translate what we learn on this scale for other utilities that are not fortunate enough to have the uh, computing power as well as the skill, uh, you know, professional like us. One follow-up comment. The folks up on the hill here, they, they deal in the issue of risk. Yeah. 
how much risk am I being exposed to or my constituents being exposed to by the decisions I make? And I think that's where I'm trying to, to get a sense of using the science to reduce risk and make better decisions, but also making sure the agencies have the tools and policies to do the right science, to make sure we're getting the right information for the public. Thank you. It's worth pointing out that um, often a, a forecast or something along those lines is only one small piece of many things that go into a decision. Uh, you could have statutory things coming into play that have nothing to do with the forecast, regulatory considerations, operational requirements for endangered fish species, many, many other things. Uh, when I showed the research funnel, or research funnel, the uh, weather manage, the water decision funnel relating to forecasting, you know, some of the decisions that have the biggest economic value or the biggest cost, uh, better put, uh, are ones that are essentially really no risk decisions. They're not public health. You know, it's not a life safety decision to say that, well, gee, we will, we, we, it looks like we will have a significantly dry year. Therefore, we will invest in spinning up a drought water bank to mitigate impacts. You know, that can be a very expensive decision to take, but there's really no downside risk uh, to it other than, you know, from public safety perspective, it's always better to over prepare for a disaster, let's say, than it is to underprepare. So I am less worried about that aspect, I suppose, than perhaps you might be. Great, thank you. Jonathan, thanks for your patience. <laughs> sure. Um, I'm intrigued by a lot of what I've seen today. It's really been very interesting. So thank you for your, for your presentations. Uh, Raja, um, I wonder if you could enlighten me. I hope this isn't too naive a question. I'm certain there's a level of naivete in it, but. What's the state of dynamical understanding of the flash drought event of 2017? And Teruso, what's the state of a dynamical understanding for the variability of the onset of the rainy season in the Tampa Bay area? So aside from models, how do we understand how these things even work? I think the, the fundamental question, what, what you're asking on 2017, we have a paper coming out on what we understand about what happened. But when it comes to that, um, what drove the fast drop off in soil moisture, we saw the precipitation shut off. But the classic sort of setting up of a um, you know, dynamical high over the region wasn't identified early. It wasn't there. And so as a result, the extent to which this becomes a driver from internal atmospheric variability is really the question. Yet my answer to your question is, we're not sure about the process-based understanding as yet. We've been able to identify post hoc some of the drivers, but I think you're on point, and it's one of the reasons why I raised it after showing something that we did do the job on, was to be able to say that, you know, without that sort of process-based understanding, we're going to constantly need to be able to do both the stochastic and deterministic, and then be able to deal with the piece of uncertainty that neither captures. Okay. So I, my point is, we don't understand it fully yet. So. And that's, thank you, that's a frank answer. And from my perspective as an academic research scientist, and this goes to Janine's comment a couple of times, I'm very interested in trying to understand how those things work. So that's a place where we could work together if there's any possible way to make that happen. And I don't know if there are ways to do that. So thanks. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I answer uh, just, I, I think you're asking as well the question Ravi is coming back to, which is, I appreciate your question. We've tried to create groups like the RISAs and others to make help this work, the Regional Integrated Sciences Assessment. But how we get at fundamental questions like that in a partnership with the academy, with the private sector, with the, the feds, is not something we've worked out organizationally as well. So I'd rather that it not be just a one-off either. So I take your point. Okay. Yeah, but from Tampa Water, I think I'm the wrong person to, to answer that. I know the challenge, and in fact, there is a paper uh, coming in Nature, one of uh, our partners from climate scientists. Uh, we know that when that uh, uh, season starts, we, you know, historically, we can define. We can define its uncertainty. But the challenge is predicting it when that transition from uh, dry season, we call it from October to May, transition. So that really, I, I cannot tell you in terms of the process driving that, but it is important for us. Okay, over here. Can you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah, my name is 
Does this work? Oh. <laughs> uh, my name is Andy Miller. I am with the American Meteorological Society. Um, uh, for a long time today, we talked about how SDS forecasting of temperature and precipitation affects humans and how we can manage that. I was wondering about the opposite side because it struck me that it would be basically impossible to forecast the river flow in Sonoma County unless we knew that they were going to release a ton of water over a few days. So how much do we need to invest in forecasting human behavior and understanding that? Because it seems to be a really critical part of um, the flow uh, in any, any one of these basins. Forecasting human behavior. <laughs> <laughs> the analogs with forecasting the physical system and the word forecasting in human behavior do not mean the same thing. <laughs> and do we need to know how the decisions that are being made influence what's in the stream and, and you know, how you do releases such as you know, uh, being able to store for fire and others? To me, those are decision-making questions. I think you have to take into account the types of things they wrap and they do, which is what's the withdrawn water, what's being put back, and so on. But I'd rather not go out on the forecasting human behavior component. So water agencies invest very large amounts of water, as Tampa Bay has done and as we is, have done in California, on uh, all kinds of water operations models that work at different time scales. So if we, given what we think is coming down the pike, we can run that through our system that simulates, uh, you know, the legal requirements for uh, in-stream flows, for water rights, uh, expected demands, all those kind of things. That's our bread and butter job, and we do that all the time. Okay, another question over here. Great, and if you could please introduce yourself, that'd be so great. Let's treat it as an and operation then I have research question. And then I have Margaret. The human right. behavior. Hi, I'm Ari Gerstmann with uh, UCAR. Um, and I, I think it's self-evident, but it's worth mentioning. Uh, and I just wanted to respond to Janine's point about how difficult it is to access NOAA vis-a-vis uh, -vis S2S forecasting because it seems to be all across the agency. And, and you mentioned how it would be helpful to access it in a manner that people might access HFIP. And I think it's worth talking a little bit about the fact that hurricanes are individual phenomenons and that there are researchers who address just hurricanes, whereas S2S is a scale, and that you're looking at a number of different phenomena with a number of different drivers of predictability uh, across that whole scale, and that saying that it would be valuable to access an agency for that information um, is, is a difficult thing for the agency to respond to. And so what I think I'd really encourage the board, both boards to, to do is to isolate some phenomena specifically. And, and I thought Shui's point on QPF is, is really it, but to, to isolate the phenomenon and then build uh, an improvement program around the phenomenon at the S2S scale, and that might be valuable. And I'm, I'm just curious about, you know, yours and Roger, if you'd respond to that from the NOAA perspective, it would be helpful. So what I was speaking to is not so much at the down in the weeds research level, but at the organizational level a little bit higher, because we're not going to tell NOAA how to do its job. But I know there are many pieces of NOAA in the room here from MAP to CPC to the labs, et cetera, that all have a piece of some kind of S2S. And the question is, how do we get those organized internally within NOAA so that then they can come together and, let's say, design an HFIP type experiment, whatever that is. I'm focusing at that organizational level, not at the, the science level. No, I, I, and I understood that. Thank you. Great. Okay, I think the last question is going to go to Margaret, unless somebody has a dying need to ask another yeah, question. Yeah, I, so. I just can't um, can't not comment on the behavior issue. Um, so it is a nascent area, but there are groups working specifically on uh, dynamical models that bring uh, human behavior decision making it, 
in line with some climate change models. It's at a very early stage. One of the issues is there are dozens of theories on behavior change. So things like theory of planned behavior, certainly going beyond the rational actor, et cetera, et cetera. And you know, I have maintained and brought up several times that these aspects, I think that the um, National Academies could play a really important role in trying to bring some of those groups together. It's also true with respect to, I believe Dave referred to it as, or you referred to it, Roger, as adaptive management, but really this is, there's a lot of work, really good work going on around adaptive governance structures. Mm -hmm. And in what conditions do we see changes made that get beyond some of the impediments you made? And I think us beginning to think about bringing biophysical scientists like us together with those groups really makes a lot of sense. Can I, can I make a quick response to sure. that? Because I do, I do want to mention that when I, you know, words like adaptive governance or anticipatory governance are to me redundant because good governance is, is both of those. But the reason why I'm saying this is, is the reason why I'm saying this on the operations research aspect, we could look at what Janine said about how, um, you know, the shape of, uh, of, of flow down the river filters through the system. But I think even more than the rational after standpoint, we need folks who understand the values behind why we choose some outcomes over others. And that's not necessarily something that I would just say the answer is to add a human model to a physical model. We failed in doing that in integrated assessment. And so I would really, if we were to add another component, there is how do people perceive risk? How do people act on it? Yeah, we know that about decision making, but how does that then matter to the usability of the S2S forecast? And I think we need to target it towards that. People like Dave and they were into data before it was big. All right. Well, I think Roger got the last word. Yay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> On Janine, you know, that never happened. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to uh, thank the panel again for their time and energy put into this. And I thought it was a really great discussion. And <laughs>